Hi there. Uh, and this is Junshan, and today we're back uh, streaming. I think uh, it's our 16th time doing so. And uh, this is the wrong screen. Let's try to capture the right one. There we go. Uh, yeah, there's some new stuff. There's music. Is that distracting? It's starting to distract me already. So maybe I will uh, turn it down. Maybe it's, let's see, fortunately. Yeah. Okay. No music. <laughs> and so therefore, I will also remove my uh, ticker, new ticker. Um, I've been playing with uh, Twitch things over the weekend and some of these things I didn't do on stream and um, yeah let me check that this is playing properly on the right screen there we go and yeah it looks like it can and um, right so just to um, reconnect with what I was doing last time on stream I was looking at um, uh, things like being notified of um, of chat and actually I ended up going the chatty route with this um, client which I did say uh, looks at it and uh, it does uh, but um, it's the most feature for client out there and so it can be um, configured to uh, to ding when um, oh well, it's actually dinging on uh, on the wrong on the wrong screen. Uh, I don't know if that can be configured. Let me put it here. So yeah, there's different settings, and in notification, you can make it so that any chat message will um, um, trigger a um, a sound notification, for instance, and you can test it, and it does work. And um, so that should be useful, and the reason I was opening the settings is to check whether I could select which screen the notifications would appear on, and um, that would be my Facebook notification, I assume. Oh, oh no, wait a minute. It is possible. I am impressed. Uh, let's hope uh, screen two is actually the correct screen. I don't want this to pop up, um, because I think uh, chat is also, right, I added some overlays so that... Uh, chat would actually appear also on stream so a bunch of stuff um, and then you know I was sort of pondering okay this is how would you say well this is part of learning to stream right and you know, being a software engineer and so like poking things and looking at how they're built on the ecosystem and I did learn a few things and around uh, you know the whole extension ecosystem on twitch and uh, some of the app ecosystem and Streamlabs and whatnot and this is fun but it's not the thing that really you know makes me excited about software engineering and so i was pondering whether i should do this but i find that really i should and so what i'm really interested in 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 life um life as it pertains to um, software engineering is, um, is well several things but I, I guess functional programming is one but also you know I guess generally the way that software is built and one of the things with how software is built is that um, you know it's basically files and networks and databases all of these things are old school and i feel like that there's a and it seems like you know academia and uh, industry is looking at this thing called crdts as a um, as an evolution in how um, in how we manage and think about data and it's really a uh, an approach which aims at making the real-time synchronization of data and data structures and um, something that's sort of part of the infrastructure, like the way that a database is part of the infrastructure. 
and when you put data in the database, you expect that you know the the the, the, the you will treat the structure of the data that you put inside the database correctly, and then if you have uh, databases that offer maybe more guarantees around the um, performance or uh, replication, then what we want is um, you know basically these things sort of become part of the infrastructure, right? And in the today's world with the internet and the web, um, it makes sense that tons of people are going to be potentially looking at the same thing, and maybe you want them to allow uh, allow each of them to actually um, write or modify that thing, not just look at the same thing, but modify that thing, and um, and that this modification will appear for everyone else. And that's a difficult problem to solve, and CRDT are there to solve that problem. And uh, with generally this approach to consistency, which is called with eventual consistency, which means that if I'm one of these thousand people doing the same thing and I write, then the 9900 or the 999 others will eventually receive my write. And um, and so the reason why conflict is an important keyword in there is because what if your two people are trying to write the same thing? Then what's going to happen? I mean, the traditional way to deal with that is saying, well, that's a conflict and therefore you need to deal with it maybe with some other um, technique. But uh, with conflict free dedicated data type, uh, it's the class of data structure that actually allow to avoid conflicts in a way doing something that functional programmers use and like is to make um, invalid states non-representable. And so, so that's all great. And um, there's a lot of work on that and a lot of interesting things. And actually one of the really interesting things is uh, ROM. And so maybe I can take a quick look at that system. And the reason why I found out about ROM is because I'm interested in um, Haskell, which is the mother or father of uh, all functional programming languages. It, that's it's not a fair account of, of, of that, but it's one of the most popular ones and the one that's the most production ready. There are lots of um, Lots of Haskell code bases around, and um, and uh, that's the case, for instance, they use it at Facebook, for example. But they use it in plenty of other places. And anyway, I came across Ron, and maybe I came across the idea of CRDT through through this. I'm not sure. I don't remember exactly. But that's something that I've also heard Tim Graham talk about in conferences, and there's different types of them. Uh, as is in the context we were talking about here with the graph DDP guarantee, there's uh, the operation-based CRDTs, also called CMRDTs or commutative um, replicated data types, and then state-based CRDTs or convergent replicated data types. And um, Ron um, says something interesting, uh, which is that, well, it's commutative, but it has an op-based approach as well. And I really like that. I think that's really awesome because it's this this idea here of being able to switch gears and make it so that you can um, sync in real time or sync periodically or sync uh, a, a snapshot of your state uh, because maybe you know, you've been disconnected for a while and then when you reconnect, then all of a sudden you get, uh, you get a, instead of getting a stream of like tons of ops, you can get just a, like a snapshot of your of a new state and, and update it. And that's that kind of seems to me like that's an approach that gets the both of, of all of these worlds. And and um, yeah, so Ron's been going through some uh, changes and it's been evolving. One of the one of the ways in which that's that's the case, some changes I think in code here is that there's a C++ implementation. And I think that currently that's the most advanced one. And that's a testament to the fact that the author, um, Driscoll here, the researcher, um, looks like a shrimp here, is um, really focused on making sure that, the, that this new part of the infrastructure is as performant as it should be, and could be, and should be, because if this thing is um, like replicated data types, 
people to be part of, um, let's say, the XPL infrastructure to be a little bit buzzwordy. And then, um, then you need it to be really fast. And um, this approach to have zero switching, that's already a smart way to make sure that it's the fastest in the context that you'd like, you know, um, but, um, but, I, I, but the approach of to rewrite this in C++ and then to also work on some further, further things like Chronosphere that we're going to talk about in a second is a way to um, further think about the low-level representation of, um, of these data types. And, um, and, and something I want to highlight here, and one of the reasons also that this is not only, I mean, that, yeah, that it's something that I didn't say, if you want, what, what's the benefit of having web scale data structures that you know, anybody can read and write to? Well, first of all, it, it feels like a, um, a model that is less centralized than most models. And actually that's technically correct because a lot of the, a lot of the sort of replicated data type approaches that you find in industry, an example is Google Docs, right? And Google Docs is actually not distributed in that it requires a central server to orchestrate the, um, the, the proper conflict-free um, semantics of the, of, the, of the Google documents. And there's lots of sort of academic and industry uh, thinking around whether the MRDT or CDRDT are the most reliable or the more um, developer-friendly APIs and whatnot, and I'm not necessarily going to get into that, but um, one thing that I think is important here is that we are talking about not a kind of one-to-end broadcast model where there's a central provider and a central big tech uh, platform that uh, sort of orchestrate all these, but in fact, more of a swarm or uh, of, um, of participants that all contribute in the evolution of this data of this data structure um, together, and that means a few interesting things. And there's other parts of the kind of distributed apps ecosystem that focus on other problems, um, but uh, looked at through the lens of uh, replicated data types, it means that you don't necessarily depend on a um, on a centralized platform. So you could have apps that actually don't need a central database server or a central um, application provider to work. The, the application could be written in a style that allows everyone to hold a little bit of a program to communicate with all of the other participants of this kind of collective uh, application and be able to, uh, um, and that that would be enough. Uh, that you just bring the network, bring those applications with these data structures and that give you a distributed application where you can hopefully scale in the number of participants. There's a number of issues with that and actually some of them are, um, are tricky like um, the role of the network in this kind of end-to-end -end packet distribution and that's a, a something that I think happens though in the infrastructure when you look at mesh networks and whatnot is that it's actually hard to scale mesh networks because of the fact that because of the uh, how is it being called uh, the um, I forget it has a name um, well I'm not a computer scientist and I'm not the engineer of computer science um, but yeah it's a quadratic problem um, and so so yeah so I'm not sure how this family of replicated data types look at this particular issue because yeah, if you have a thousand, um, if you have a thousand uh, participant, then any one participant potentially exchanges data with nine hundred ninety-nine others, and that um, is arguably more than um, the one-to-end model. So, um, so yeah, leaving that aside, um, my leaving that aside, I think it's a good moment to actually introduce my disclaimer here. I like to follow tangents, and uh, I do think with the hope uh, that it's going to be useful to other people, but also it's mainly to satisfy my own curiosity about working in the open and sort of doing open source, like kind of radically by just actually open sourcing, not just, you know, snapshots with commits, 
but they are even more thinking and they're working and and uh, they're also learning in the open because I am not um, an expert uh, pure code programmer. I am not an expert at all on what it is data types, but I love learning about these things. I find them super exciting and I want to learn more about them. And I think both sort of working and learning in the open seems like that's a fun thing, but it might be uh, disorganized. Uh, it might be harder, it might be hard to follow. And uh, so it might not be satisfying you know to audiences <laughs> so i'm aware of that so i i do want i do want feedback on that for sure if there's way to make it more interesting and um, organized uh, but that's that's something i'm thinking about in general I'm, I'm really interested in the area of thinking about the role of this type of um, this, this this approaches to working in the open and how to improve the noise that seems to be generated um, by that and try to find ways to make the the, the signal more uh, apparent to audiences and also to the right audiences, right? So anyway, yeah, that's my disclaimer. I gave myself courage to do this first uh, training session about things that I don't I know I don't know a lot about um, by thinking about the fact that there was a disclaimer. Hey, put it out there, uh, you know, and um, and that's what I did. So anyway, continuing. Um, yeah, the thing I wanted to say about CRDTs and uh, you know the, the completely distributed model versus a cent central server model is that one of the key, really important thing, and I hinted about that by talking about this multiple gear um, model now, is the idea of offline use. And that's something that other folks in the ecosystem talk about, like uh, DAT and Beacon, uh, Arthur grows up. Um, um, you can browser and uh, all of that stuff is also open with a Beacon API and there is a hidden thing that I can put that there. Is that one? Oh, there we go. Let's put that now. This is our Beaker, not Beacon. Okay. Beaker. There we go. Beautifully web browser, and this is uh, this is an awesome awesome application of this type of approach. Even though that is not per se a CRDT, but it's a it's a something built on top of um, of, a, of that project. It's something built on top of Hypercore, which is a um, a structure that a data structure that's a, a append only data structure that's a really good building block for. A replicated data structure that can afford to do integrated check of at each step. So that might be that might sound a little bit obscure, but maybe if I go down into kernel plugs, I'll, I'll come back to this. And uh, this guy is hypercore. Uh, let's um, move to that. I'm gonna put um, links in here, and I'll put this thing uh, somewhere. Actually, I'll also, uh, yeah, I'll find uh, on my other machine, um, uh, I'll, I'll take a note of this. Um, let's call this environment. It, it, it is a question of development environment, but not only because it's also a training environment and whatnot. And um, I'll find what the tab copy and Chrome extension I'm using is like, and by the way, I discovered that Edge ex uh, Chrome extensions can be installed in Edge, which makes sense from a um, technical standpoint because it uses the same engine, but it could have been blocked and there's actually an option to allow it to happen and that's pretty dang cool. Um, and uh, yeah, and this tab copy thing uh, allows to take all your tabs and copy them and then I could have those all in the links. So I might, uh, I might continue to open lots of tabs because I do that in my life. My life is full of many, many tabs and um, and then I copy them and then I close them. And hopefully uh, there'll be tools with tools to do this kind of thing. There are tools, but obviously I don't, because I'm not interested in those things, I kind of want to build the tools that do that. Anyway, that's a tangent and coming back to the whole reason why I'm talking about that and Hypercore and Beaker. 
is that um, the folks at Beaker explained this very well. There's a few conferences online um, where they explain this. Is this is really uh, a vision of uh, a web that's more distributed and in which it doesn't take you to. Um, it doesn't re requires individuals to you know rent a server and uh, learn how to deploy a web server and then you know put their little HTML payload in there um, for it and then buy a domain name for it to be available to other basically publish a website right uh, right now to today publishing a website requires all these steps but with the um, Beaker browser uh, actually and uh, the underlying idea of behind CRDCs and distributed web data structure web store data structure and peer to peer actually you can um, you can distribute. You can shorten that that path, and you can make the the web writable in a way that's much much easier. And uh, so this is the, the, the kind of the family of of issues that um, that this looks at. And uh, you know what? I'm going to get that uh, tab copy uh, Chrome extension because I I only want to use it because I want to close these tangents there to to give myself a sense that I'm actually popping the sockets some of the some of the things I need right so yeah and I do want to give a little shout out there at the um, the people that inspire me working in this fashion even though I feel like I have no earthly level that they do um, in the peer script community um, you know shout out to six foot six foot who did this and um, and Pierre Freeman these people are Super good, super inspiring, and um, and then there's Edward Edward Smith. Um, I think, I mean, as far as I know, one of the first guys who started streaming uh, on Twitch. Uh, some of the he was streaming Haskell on Twitch. Uh, sorry, actually, I think the first, but but that stuff is so inspiring. A, a lot of time above my capacity to understand, but it's inspiring because it makes me want to understand more. And uh, that stuff is great. So, um, okay, tab copy has been installed, which means that now I can copy my 11 tabs in Windsor and put them in here. And I've um, allowed myself to create this right path. Okay, and then I'll publish this somewhere. Um, and uh, what was I saying? Well, I was talking about uh, the fact that this is the family of problems that this type of distributed data structure, distributed computing that's actually peer-to-peer, -peer, um, meaning it's the users that actually are hosting the data, that this stuff is super neat. And then uh, also one of the things that I really like is this idea of the fact that it's tolerant to offline working, which is a really great capability. I don't want to be online all the time. I don't want to be in physically located in places that are connected all the time and so i think that this even if there's network you know 3g 4g 5g everywhere on the planet and i might not want to be connected still and i want to be able to disconnect and reconnect and um, still be able to um, for this this type of apps that i was describing to to work and receive the latest about uh, about what happened and so that stuff um it to me is super important that uh, that this is distributed data structure allow this kind of um, offline uh, capability and uh, ron definitely does that and um, what happened um, is that after uh, a bit um, the same author uh, Viktor Grushenko uh, came up with a Chronofold data structure. And um, this data structure is aimed at a specific, a specific problem, which is to do CRDC for um, text parsers, basically, for uh, things like exactly this that we see on the right. And, um, and so that's basically the, s you know, the same problem that Google Docs is solving. Um, except it, it would be doing this in a, in a distributed fashion, but there's tons of uh, approaches that actually do um, text-based uh, CRDCs out there. Um, and is there something specifically about text in the Wikipedia article? I think maybe 
structure we're doing, the collaborative structure we're doing. So th this was actually an initial motivation of this film. And um, yeah, there's a lot of different approaches to do that. And um, there's this great, um, uh, uh, this great uh, author, I, I can forgot the name of him, um, Martin. So this is um, this is a great um, a blog post on um, on CRDTs and um, and in there uh, they go in a lot more detail that I would well I'm not so accurate I might go into as much detail when we start on implementation but um, into some of the history and uh, the details and uh, uh, lands on this. Uh, particular approach, which is causal trees, actually I should put put that in quotes in the in the paper. Um, um, da, da, da. As you raise, So OT is what uh, the Google Docs was originally based on, and then there are some advances on that. And then causal trees are a particular way to, in my view, annotate data structures with this notion of what was there before and uh, what is the operation, the operation that I'm writing now, uh, what it depends on, or what I knew when I when I wrote into that structure. What was the state of the world when I entered that that new character from from some matrix pattern? And so, causal trees do that, and uh, with that, together with a specific merge algorithm, they're able to be counted too. And so that's all good and great, and there's advantages and disadvantages to different models. And um, but on the other end of the spectrum, there's something about the specifics of Data structure for tests. Um, that's uh, and and Chronofold is basically right at the intersection of best practices for for replicated data types and best practices for text representations. And so an example of that would be VS Code and the text buffer reimplementation uh, blog post. That's not compliant with what was there. Okay. And um, right, so they explain um, how they implemented uh, the text buffer in a way that's much more efficient. And um, it's really about what the low level representation of characters is like so that um, you get things like inserting in the middle and inserting whole blocks of text in a way that's efficient and doesn't require uh, copying the data structure and uh, or doing things like slicing inside the data structure which are really inefficient. And so uh, so that's all great and um, and and basically Chronofold is the best of CRDTs with the best of text buffer implementations. So it's really exciting. Um, and um, there's actually a Rust implementation of Chronofold, uh, apart from the, uh, the explanation in the paper itself. And, um, and I should also mention that the author gave a talk in, in GitHub about, uh, about Chronofold, and actually fantastic that it isn't here. I was actually looking at this because this is not in the paper and that's super useful to understand how, um, how it works. So I will leave it there. Um, um, but I was I want to talk about the Rust implementation, and that's on GitHub dot tool somewhere. Chronofold. 
So seeing the Rust implementation a while back, I started thinking, hey, well, you know, I'm not really familiar with building low-level data structure at all. I've never done it, and but it's super exciting, and I see that uh, um, that there's a lot to learn uh, by doing that, and also I'd love to use some of that for you know, some of my own projects. I, I, like I said before, I think that having this type of thing, almost like a, a, a ubiquitous and available as a, as a database, mm, makes sense. And so I want my application to have these capabilities of working offline, working peer-to-peer, -peer and still being able to real-time sync. So, um, so Chronosol seemed awesome for that. And when I saw that someone actually started doing a, ver a Rust implementation, then that was really exciting. I thought, well, you know, let's try and do this. And um, and and well, I guess there are several choices of uh, of implementation languages, right? I mean, but the the functional, the strongly typed functional programming that I'm most familiar with is uh, PureScript. Um, it uh, kind of follows in the footsteps of Haskell in many different ways. Um, you could argue Haskell might be a different, a better programming language to implement such a data structure, but simply for the reason that um, there's a lot more um, documentation and folklore uh, and attention to implementing low-level data structure in Haskell, and that's something that I've actually not seen a lot of done in Chronos in PureScript, and the reason is that. That's something that I haven't seen done a lot in JavaScript, actually. And if you look, there is actually a whole ecosystem of, of course, people implementing uh, data structures in the JavaScript ecosystem, absolutely, and uh, paying a lot of attention to how uh, JavaScript engines work, interpreters um, work in order to make things run fast. And, and that's interesting, but not necessarily a selling point, right? Uh, in terms of PureScript or Haskell, but in my view, um, the browser and therefore JavaScript is kind of the ubiquitous um, operating system of the web, right? So um, being able to distribute your code through a web page and, um, and then enabling code distributed by a web page to actually use these features of real-time sync in a peer-to-peer -peer fashion to me, that's super exciting because it means that it would run in the browser, and then um, you know with Node, and uh, it would also run uh, on a server if we wanted to, and then you know maybe muster the courage to run write a Haskell implementation at some point, or you know to be honest, it could be that starting to write uh, pure script, I just find that it's too that it's actually useful to just try. Haskell implementations um, just to um, to have more access to the culture of building low-level data structure in Haskell, um, but we shall see. Anyway, I started. Uh, this gave me courage to um, to try and look at it. It doesn't implement all of the things that are mentioned in the paper, which is also actually pretty awesome. It means that. You know, it, it wouldn't necessarily be just about replicating what's written here, but maybe also pushing the ball a little bit further, which is great for uh, as an incentive and a motivator. So, um, yeah, so, and then it means also that I get to read a, read a bit of Rust, and I don't program in Rust, but it's fun to uh, um, to read a new language. And so, so there I am. Um, and so I guess, um, a very short summary of what Chronosol does might be a good idea, um, but I also want to say something about my environment, which is that uh, right now um, I don't even have my code base uh, replicated to this computer because I worked on the other computer, so I'm going to actually do a little bit of uh, just how would you say housekeeping, you know, that's the other way to call this. Um, and so that's not the word per se, but uh, um, but yeah. But uh, yeah, what uh, I mean, I guess the what or yeah, what what we're working on is um, the pure script implementation of the Chronosol data structure. Um, but we're also doing some meta things like just setting up the environment to do so. And uh, yeah, also this is a PC, uh, Windows 
this one and then I've been working on Mac for 15 years so and plus this is my Windows savvy so I just try to get through the minimal install of Linux books and things like that just to get on it so I should be logging in when I go home but I go fast nowadays right but anyway when I started I didn't like this um, so but maybe before diving in yeah just explaining rapidly what some of the principles are uh, so here um, we have uh, th th three sites or three processes or three I like to think of them as three replicas um, so alpha has its own um, alpha is typically let's say a computer right a different computer and beta is another computer somewhere on the network and gamma is another computer on the network and they all do this thing of editing a piece of text together and uh, so in this example alpha starts with uh, alpha 6 so it starts with uh, with its own uh, it basically alpha has written pins and um, and so there's a couple of things we can note here is that there's this uh, empty uh, uh, initiator character at the beginning of the data structure and this cross data structure at the end and um, and then each um, each item in this data structure is indexed by this index alpha t and so at the state alpha 6 we can say that alpha has uh, six um, indices inside its local data structure because beta and gamma will have a different data structure and it's not just because they're different machines but actually because that's one of the keys to the kernel fault is that they all have uh, the same data structure modulo some kind of ordering of them um, and so but we'll get into that but so alpha uh, 6 uh, starts with pins and then what we imagine is that uh, beta and gamma connect and then they both receive alpha 6 and so now uh, at uh, sort of this point in time here in this diagram alpha beta and gamma are synced and they all have exactly the same data structure which can be noted as alpha 6 so um, so it means that there is an alpha 6 at alpha there is an alpha 6 at beta or on beta and there is an alpha 6 on gamma so all of this um, uh, would ideally require some conventions of uh, speech and annotation uh, that i think are not obvious and i ran into that when I was doing implementation. And so I, I haven't converged yet on something that makes sense to me uh, because I think the, the paper and the video use potentially slightly different notation sometimes. So anyway, um, anyway, what happens at, um, let's say, at this time, right? And so um, at, at this time we have beta writing, uh, writing uh, backspace and capital M. And so with its cursor after P. So with, uh, with beta at its cursor uh, just after P, hitting backspace, it will delete P and then hitting M capital M, it will insert M. And so now beta sees mint and is in the state called here alpha six beta eight. And um, then, um, there's potential there's several things that happen at the same time um, we can decompose them but that let's look at the fact that here we see that alpha is connected to beta in this example and receives the alpha 6 beta 8 data structure and so that's awesome um, so this alpha 6 beta 8 just gets copied to, uh, to alpha and now alpha instead of alpha 6 has exactly this same structure alpha 6 beta 8 exactly in this order and so a few things to note here um, one is that what i said with um, beta insert uh, hits backspace while the cursor is between two and three that's actually captured in the data structure by this next um, property meaning that when beta 7 is entered at the same time a reference to what the character just before it was is also added inside this new piece of information that they've added so in beta 7 actually this arrow is captured 
So really you could say that this uh, arrow head is inside the piece of data that data uh, uh, has in its own chronophore when it clicks backspace. And then it clicks M, and so M is connected to data seven. And then um, it happens that you could also infer, um, or I, yeah, I think you can infer that I has a, a link to, to M, right? And so that's a bit of bookkeeping of where is the arrow and um, the paper suggests an implementation of that that's very efficient based on um, things like these tables and uh, efficient text reconstruction. Okay, so nothing is magic at this point because we haven't introduced the, 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 the special case that CRDs are meant to address, uh, which is conflict. And so that's exactly what Gamma is doing because at the same time that Beta is clicking backspace on capital M, Gamma is um, maybe disconnected or maybe has a slow network or maybe types super fast or has just, um, uh, or for some other reason, uh, does more work and um, clicks backspace uh, four times in a row and then writes INSK in um, lowercase letters. And so that's, we call that state alpha safe gamma 14 and alpha safe gamma 14, as you can see here, is the state that you can find in Carcel gamma or in site gamma or in replica gamma. And um, um, something I haven't said and I should go back to alpha six beta h here is that what's, it, what's expected is that when um, as beta enters backspace on capital M, even though the chrono four gets um, added these two new pieces of information, what is rendered on screen um, is minced, right? Uh, because um, the at time seven, the index seven at beta, when uh, then it's int, and then at time eight, at site beta, then it's mint, right? Instead of print. So that's the same thing here. Alpha six gamma 14 has uh, the rendered uh, text um, uh, value that is print with lowercase int. So now we have um, a exactly the case where we potentially have a conflict here because um, those two sites, uh, two processes were writing something on the same initial data, uh, but uh, differently. So we have a nerf conflict, right? No, wrong. We don't have a nerf conflict because of how um, nerf, resolu uh, nerf conflict resolution is actually baked into the algorithm for chronofall um, called a TV, uh, a causal tree nerf algorithm here. Um, and that allows to actually have have it so that we can converge to a unique end state for all replica and uh, or all processes. And what's specific and I think pretty, I think unique, um, uh, but I'm not 100% sure, but what's unique about this is that it converges on the end state that's written in the buffer, but the chrono folds are different. And so that's a super neat trick, which is that while the chrono folds are different, they all evaluate to the same value. And so that's, that's, the, that's the guarantee of the algorithm, uh, although I don't know if it's been uh, finally uh, proven, but that's the guarantee is that even if those things are in a different order, this causal tree data structure and its merge algorithm actually allows a data structure locally, each replica to be holding a data structure that is in fact different. What I was saying, modulo the order of uh, of some changes, even if uh, so. Let's look at this specifically. So um, here we imagine that um, that gamma um, has is now uh, connected and it's receiving. Um, it's not connected to beta, and so it's it's uh, to, to, to to think of it from the point of view of. Um, of what's written on their screen, beta has minced written on their screen and gamma has prints with lower cap, uh, uh, initial cap print on their screen. And so then gamma connects to beta and then um, basically they realize that they both 
are hanging from the same inch of weight, meaning that these, this uh, seven here, uh, this at time seven, gamma did uh, some action on P, while uh, beta also did some action on the same P. And so mer the merge algorithm um, then kicks in because it means that there is, I think, what's called, uh, what is it, a sister or something, a sibling, let's see, what is it again, a preemptive sibling. Uh, well, I think preemptive sibling, yeah. Uh, uh, well, uh, there's, a, there's something else in there, which is that uh, preemptive sibling is actually, I think, the sibling that comes before me in the ordering of replicas or, or processes. So the thing that you need to add to this whole set of uh, for it to work is that um, all replicas need to be um, all, uh, yeah, the replicas need to be ordered. Um, should be able to say that this replica comes before the other and that this order is global. It's shared with all replicas. So all replicas know all the other replicas position and they know where they fit in in that order and um, and so the fact that they know that means that uh, gamma knows that beta needs to go first and then once it when once it has gone then it sort of writes on top of it and then obtains the final beta subject i mean that's a, a very uh, rough way to to, to say it but it, i don't think it's correct but it's uh, it's it's a nice it's um, shortcut to think of it and uh, then beta is also knows that uh, except it knows that it's supposed to go first and so it's it does the same trick and it's able to get to the same final state um, so basically it's if you if you have the structure of the tree and you know who goes first then you're able to converge you're able to get to the same final state so that's it in a sense, and that's uh, what the paper describes. And um, the, the key bit here, uh, well, uh, one of the key bits here, it, it's not really the key bit of the paper really, because actually this bit I think is really the, um, the causal tree bit. So it's more described in the causal tree, but some of the stuff that comes out afterwards is really neat because it's about really making this efficient and defining uh, index structures, which are called the cost structures, which accompany this causal tree structure in order to make things more efficient progressively um, through structures like sparse arrays and, um, and reverse indexes and, and so on. So it's doing a bunch of smart things to make this data structure really fast. So that's it in a nutshell for the algorithm. And so, um, so that's kind of what I was, uh, I, I mean, I was looking at various things in pure script um, and trying to decipher some of, some of this part. So let's, uh, let's, let's, let's see what's up. Uh, I'm going to do this off screen for now um, and check out the stuff that I've been retrieving from my map. work and the fees will come down 19th of December so it looks like we are going great so I shall and by the way I'm using uh, sync things to um, to keep my training PC and my work map synchronized and that's one of the things that hopefully can be improved by um, well not corner flag but realities and uh, um, but that's for another day okay so can I open this in visual studio I can try I don't know if I can try that now and here we go so there's um, work on a previous attempt and um, and then some stuff that I was uh, looking at uh, Friday, I think. Um, so 
and to get back into the into the paper. Okay. So now, however, it would be good to have a um, a shell and um, and just click install on that. And I think maybe I have done it, but uh, let's see. Um, and I think I have to revert to PowerTrain, but. Case ID uh, seven zero. It works. That's nice. I mean, let's see because I'm actually using the dot spago from my Mac. So in theory, if this has some uh, node module, then it would crash. So in this case, I could avoid um, a bit. So maybe I will. Maybe I will ask Simpson to not copy that no I think I asked it not to copy the node modules folder but maybe that's fine I don't know I think it's already fine actually so that's good Yeah, I think that's the, some of the stuff I was working on. Um, up, yeah, I think that's some of the stuff I was working on. Okay, cool. Okay, so um, let's open. Okay. So. Um, one of the things that I've been sort of thinking of is um, to not focus on performance first, right? I think that's a fairly standard approach, even though this is meant to be a performant data structure. I mean, I don't, I probably won't, <laughs> won't follow my own, uh, my own advice here, but at least I've got my, my entry point. I think I'll get pretty fast uh, because that's my experience <laughs> trying to work on this kind of stuff. I'll get pretty fast. Uh, interested in um, actually low-level performance for these things, and that should be an interesting exploration in itself. But as I'm, but as a very uh, initial building uh, sort of approach here, um, I'm not yet thinking about performance. So, so we start with uh, what I call a replica, even though in the paper it's called a process. Um, um, I don't know; it fits my understanding better. Um, could be also a site or an author, and actually sometimes it's also called an author. I'm not sure whether author is meant to completely be the same as a process. So, uh, so I call it replica, and right now it's just a new type and a, a variant. Um, and then, and then I have replica index. Um, all right. So that's because they have a because of this idea of that the timestamp would be both a replica and a replica index, meaning that it makes sense to talk about six in, in this diagram only if we specify that it's on alpha, because as we've said, uh, it could be that the ordering is different on beta and gamma. Uh, we see that here, we see in this notation, it was really, uh, really one same source, but on beta, it was alpha 6, beta 8, and then gamma 14. Whereas on gamma, it was first gamma 14, and then beta 8, right? So we know that this converges to, to the same at the end, but, um, but the local data structure, uh, specifically uh, on index 7, uh, well, well, no, actually on index 7 of um, gamma here, uh, on index 7 of gamma, we have gamma 7, whereas on index 7 of beta, we have beta 7. So yeah, this is in beta, this is on beta, and this is on gamma. Um, so, so it only makes sense to speak of a timestamp or a local index um, if you mention which replica you're talking about here. Okay, so that's okay. I I feel like that maybe there's this, there's something here in abstraction wise that could be done to to make this 
preview or like maybe it's an API thing. I, I don't know yet. Um, but um, but we'll continue. Um, then uh, then we have a value, and the value is actually just a character, right? And then if we import Unicode, that was one of the last things that I did as well. Like I imported the the string package to do this somewhat properly by importing a Unicode value here. And um, and then an op, and this is um, what's written directly in the pull code. An op is a tuple of uh, ordered work, an ordered log of tuple. Um, so subjectively ordered log of tuple. So what the subjectively ordered means is that it's really indexed by this timestamp. Um, and um, and then a value. And so this value is, um, you see value t points to the cherry here. It's the actual character. So um, there is the cross point. And then um, the index here, uh, which is explained, it's the W alpha i is the operation following alpha i in the loop. So this is, in fact, what I was saying before is wrong, meaning p, like when we add the, the backspace, actually p starts pointing to the backspace character. So, and, and then m is added and points to its following character. So it's, but that is, that's a representation choice. In, in any case, uh, later in the paper, uh, there's a reverse index that's introduced. And I think, uh, so, so in the end, uh, both uh, um, going from, um, going from um, um, myself to the next or uh, to the previous is we're gonna have fast indices to, to get there anyway. So it probably doesn't matter which one you have in the core structure as opposed to the core structure, but I'm not 100% sure of that. Um, it could be that uh, because the main structure is used as the as the central uh, spine of the data structure, that actually it does matter. But uh, maybe we'll play with that later. Um, and so that's um, right. So that's uh, the index at alpha of the next thing to alpha i which is the timestamp so um, this alpha i becomes this timestamp and then we say that uh, given this timestamp we have associated to it we have a ref of maybe a timestamp which is um, and i guess i, I if i'm not inconsistent i had So it has a value at t or alpha i here, and it has a it has maybe a timestamp because because I reused the uh, the ref uh, source implementation there where um, where that main data structure is wrapped in an action that I uh, made it and I was interesting. So then if we do one plus two again, and yeah, it's an option. Next indices, what it is next. And option was what is, yeah, maybe, maybe root is this. I'm not sure. No, reference is this, right. And so the first sort of reference is the option of a log index. So already, and I think what's changed here is supposed to be the character, uh, but in this case, it's, yeah, it's, this is all parameterized on the, the author type, which means replica and the T type, which is, I think, the type that is, um, in, in any case, the cross point. So I haven't abstracted over that yet. And uh, right, and so then we do change T here, and find predecessor is kind of supposed to use that reverse index, I believe, because the, the follower must be the reference, something like that. indices is the is the one and yeah I'm not 
Okay, I forgot what this is, so I think I'll go ahead and do one of those. Oops. And the clock is not that recognizable. Stop. Disable. Disable. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of called a blog. The root is only an index, um, I'm not sure what it should be, and then this call index array index index structures, and um, and um, and root is a, a self root, not conducted by self root, uh, it's like a supply chain and then self root is the same. Does it I suppose if there is a predecessor, no, so if there's a predecessor, then something, otherwise, where does it? So maybe that's only true for the flow starter, because I don't know, maybe there's a better encoding for that. Um, but it's true that um, maybe root is just this itself. So yeah, I'm not sure about the representation for that. I'm not sure about this representation. No, that's something else. That's the reference. Oh, well, actually, it's connected, right? Um, because if you, if what you remember is the, uh, uh, is the, is the, the following uh, alpha i, then, um, then it's the terminator that is the truth graph across. That means that you have a neighbor here. So prob maybe a better there is a better representation for this. And also, I was as I was writing this, I was like, well, I'll hold on. That means that actually op really is a a, a, um, a function from that that's sent to a reference value, right? So that's that's something we know from classical JavaScript world that usually you can tabulate your functions. Um, I think that means that op is representable from some angle. A little bit off my uh, uh, grammar to avoid that, but uh, I think that makes sense. And uh, so that's a single operation, and so that describes basically uh, this thing, right? Indexed by this number. So I'm happy with having it like flat and and simple. And then um, and then and then what? And then um, and then we have a an actual chronicle and by the way I'm not even sure of what the chronicle is supposed to be uh, maybe it's supposed to be this um, right or, or so is the proper language that gamma's chronicle is this and then uh, this and then beta's chronicle is all, all of that uh, or is chronicle is oh sorry is maybe um, yeah, so chronofold are instantiated in different orders at different sites or different replicas, but uh, can all be interpreted as the same um, as the same um, uh, value, a rendering value, let's call it. So I created a rendering set out of this sequence. Um, so maybe this is not log and it's chronofold. Um, Log is short and short and sweet, right? Um, also, it makes me think of uh, makes me think of uh, event sourcing and um, append and append. It's an append only data structure, so it's kind of a very log esque, right? And here I done something which I'm sure I what was it next, um, which is that I have a of something that uh, annotates in the log, and then um, and then I have an array of ops. And so what we're kind of saying is, um, yeah. So we could have like a non-empty array of ops here, right? With with always this um, invariant beginning um, 
appreciator that does stuff for me. Oh yeah, that's good. And um, yeah, and then I was trying to do something. Uh, right, for this game afterwards, what I was trying to do was uh, you know I, I wanted to write write this as a test to have something to program against and so um, so in this we have a, a file alpha that was equal to a one beta that was equal to a two and then alpha log or alpha is chronoform is um, okay to uh, have uh, the word feature here it's got the alpha and starts with an empty uh, list of ops and beta uh, same but uh, with it for beta and then um, alpha log at t1 if we imagine that uh, t1 is somewhere uh, somewhere in here well that's actually the well yeah it's t1 if t0 is here and then t1 is somewhere here or here actually t1 is here i kind of want to have that one like this and annotate it somehow. Can I do s to r star grad? Oh yeah. Alpha is six um, and beta or is that yeah. No 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 no. Alpha at alpha six beta going to be a tau or something right it can't be a t this is just t t is used here as the index for the subjective or the other one the subjective index right so t so yeah there's a question of whether this alpha is on the t or if it's on the n index there so so what i was saying was that um, there's a t0 in which all of that stuff tolls are empty a tau zero, and then there's a tau one at which alpha has this alpha six, like that. And um, I'm gonna do this in a comment. So, so what would the what would the API look like? Well, I started by I started by append uh, well writing an append op operation. Uh, Function, but then obviously really fast it gets it gets uh, tiring and uh, it makes sense to um, to spam um, spam and then oh I, I know I think I should I can do something <laughs> should I do this on screen I mean I guess I should do this on screen right or maybe not I'm just going to be smart with my um, my chatty and ask it not to ding ding me when um, I have that um, have that not this LibreOffice thing that I always do is uh, is there so um, much something to look at later I shall uh, put it in the list of uh, pin things in the world um, okay which just spam and I just had the index here I mean I actually never really stuff in this thing so I don't know how it all works okay so um, right oh I need a representation for backspace actually is that really is that really something that we need to be aware for my I don't think we do 
Oui, oui, on doit se, on doit se souvenir de quand tu es sur base, tu es en solo. Hmm. Euh, voilà, so let's look at these images. And what I'm seeing is that they fold over at a char um, after converting the string using two constraint array to the string to array of constraint. And so we can fold over that, uh, starting with um, a current log. And, uh, and then appending a char is um, some basic housekeeping uh, to augment. Um, so t becomes becomes not the index but the current time stamp so something that in fact this representation wouldn't so it's not really a bad representation and it has been seeing a lot of a lot of uh, incorrectitude by saying that uh, we could go from one to the other mm, no right no I'm being confused by myself right now We need to keep track of the current index for each local chromophore. And it seems like probably, I mean, well, in addition to the length of the, of the opt array, so this is the question. And in addition to the opt array, probably not, right? I think I don't, and but what I do is that I need to find out what is the current length of the array. And so that's not cool because that's, I mean, I think the array is O1, but still, uh, you know, maybe that's why. But maybe we can reduce it to uh, a smaller constant factor um, if we saw it. Uh, and uh, then we append a operation and we need to calculate if we have a char we need to calculate the op uh, based on the local subjective index so well so the new t that's appended uh, here so this is seven in our case or the, the the backspace we need to write that seven here and that seven is really seven beta in fact i think it's correct to think of it as seven annotated with beta so maybe i will something like that here and maybe I'll call it um, beta I can't read uh, a uh, there's a weird thing where I can't see uh, uh, subscript so beta subscript so I need to do t beta and so t beta is obviously here six um, but you could argue that it's six beta and uh, I'm playing with uh, representations here because I feel like maybe maybe it will make things easier to understand uh, depending on how we annotate our subjective things so I, I don't know if this will really fit but um, we shall see but here we could say that we're adding um, that our t is definitely uh, replica and current plus one so given that um, beta one in this example, uh, well, yeah, beta one at t at tau two, at tau two, uh, well, no, at tau three because at tau two beta beta is actually uh, the same as uh, as alpha. Um, I think that's interesting. We could say that beta six at beta. Beta is at oh I can't see it so I don't know what I'm looking at here at uh, I don't know I'm not pretty sure that uh, thingy um, so beta is at value beta six uh, no uh, value alpha six in fact yes 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 so 
Let's go ahead and move it. Data is at value alpha set at time data set. That helps to differentiate the fact that here we talk about alpha at 6 alpha. Well, why not? Let's see if it works. Um, right, so here I haven't written how beta 1 receives alpha 1. And actually that's where I was when I started to think about the update monad and felt I had to do a few presentations, but I, I'm, I'm getting there. Um, let's just finish for uh, the simplistic implementation of atom char. So we need to uh, create an op based on the car that we receive, the char we receive. And so we, uh, so if we were like, this is not the case in this test, but uh, again, we are imagining that we are actually at at um, at at time seven beta, so we're at the, our content. Our content is about to be alpha six beta seven instead of alpha six beta eight. And so we just broke this backspace, and so we take the current uh, length of the array as the local array. And we um, give t is this t local, right? And we um, we increment this by one, and we know we will since we just pass the log of the local replica. And it feels like some of these things might be annotated with local at some later points because there will be synchronization things where we receive the data from another replica, and then we will want to identify those functions. Um, yeah, and then, and then, uh, well, then we switch to that val on um, on the ref where, and so uh, first we add the comp cut point as the value um, that gets the the char right. So I'll quickly drop the cut point here, and and the ref, and so I thought. Um, Right, and the ref, I thought uh, that this ref, mm, because I didn't loop the data correctly, um, and I don't know if this is going to come bite us in the ass later, but uh, it might, because the earlier version is usually in the wrong direction, but I'm still going to persist with it for a little bit, um, thinking that the ref is actually linking to the character that was before. So I'm inverting the arrows in some way um, but I'm also I, I also realize I well there needs to be a mutation oh wow I, I haven't thought of that for because when we add this then we need to change then sure we add this with its arrow okay fine but then we need to mutate I so that now it points to um, it points to that backspace right in in alpha alpha six beta seven, and we have an arrow like this, and then an arrow to i. So then, if um, if I'm storing if I'm storing things basically as a linked list, let's just call it that way, then I actually need to mutate e to add uh, to change it to change back to this. I think it's always going to be confusing if I do something different than the character here. So let's 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 uh, avoid all the cases of mutation until we better understand all this. Um, but uh, yeah, in any case, whichever direction. So so I need to reverse how I calculated my ref here. But then it means that actually that's not enough. I know I then need to go into the log and mutate the the back. Uh, mutate the reference of uh, of i. So maybe that's something that's really clear and that needs to be done with uh, with the uh, secondary logs. Um, mutating the secondary logs. 
This is what we're going to need to start it back. Why are you not clicking on it? Corner that dog. I think it depends on where we are tonight. It's still going to be a rough call for us to try to figure out where that dog in the mail rider is on. But this, I mean, this uh, challenges my intuition that we were talking about up and down the road. But then the question is, where do where does this arrow go? Um, is it where you were? Is the location following out by arrow in the room? There is something I want to be on top of from the hint here that contains the read, and thus any version of the text. There's a C notation which I think that I would read this, so I'll write this dot with the mark with the points that are marked, which is where the hint was. But then when you add Bevan back here, when you add it, if I say M, I think it would go where you left out here. Or is this in the bar itself? Hold on. something I've missed, or haven't yet understood about the data structure here, I think, no, okay, so that's not going to be where uh, I'm going to be, it's going to be where it's going to be, right, but I need to find where this is supposed to have an attention, um, so I think this is still the marriage, um, let's see what uh, data list of SOC is we got here, I think there's the same uh, there's the same question of the read um, left with uh, and the cause of the three as I was in Ajara for what I think um, is the what I think is the right uh, control alt bar right so Basically, what is going to help us out in the read of the data blob, along with the community read associated with the array to create a host function that can always generate an array for whichever array has blocks or an array. Annotation based on the location mark in the read of the data blob with an implicit input value to create an empty for read by a string of points with two small points. Then maybe it's a way or that was it the other way. The CDR reads the data blob is simply defined as a new introduction of operation to be sufficiently combined. We don't have the best of both both worlds, an eminently mergeable data structure together with the ability to define a data model in terms of a domain structure. Ouch. If we have a second CDR to treat as a single array, we have some data to work with. Here's an example of a, a host with annotation. So we have the site, uh, site one writes CMD, site two writes the um, after that. same time, site 3 at the same time writes ART, and site 1 then uh, deletes ND and writes TTRL, T -T, uh, writes TRL, and then we want this to converge where to TTRL and TEL. So site 1 types T, oh this is what I wanted to say, the input result is the most intuitive merge we could expect. So that's really what we want, and that's what this other guy gave us. Um, first idea, let's take the standard set of arrows away from here, take AM.0. So that's, uh, right, so yeah, it's just trying to do this without maintaining the that causal arrow. Um, so that work, um, da 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 but it's easy to fix by giving each one a global unit ID in the form of an owner URID plus a lamp or tag stub. So I, yeah, th I don't think in kernel 4 you have to add uh, a lamp or tag stub. So I'm not sure how that works. 
Quindi da when below it is empty to the first is zero, or unless the length of that point signals a much much local, like a subjective order is sufficient. Uh, no, I'm just going to use it for the whole thing. So, so SX is the UID for site X prime, and Y is the time spent. Uh, so yeah, that's that's what we understand then. So with this scheme, no two operations will have the same ID. Operations on the same memory will have different time spans, while operations on different memories will have different UIDs. Then the LAN forecasting will be used to plot the operation into causal order. Using the UIDs for time working when some sort of operation happened to have the same time span. Yeah, so that's the fact that lower, I mean, local ordering is e enough until we have a conflict and then we need to order to use the order of the uh, thing use an ordering of sites for our local conflicts and now when a new operation array arrives from the remote peer the node is as simple as its weight on its first two of arrays and shift in any new operation to the proper spot in the memory memory for the remote peer It seems to work at first approximation, but then there's major issues. There's the problem of reconstructing web because we're we're uh, shifting things, so that's not very efficient. Let me draw a square. And then second, intent is completely clobbered. Like um, reading the operations back, it gets something along the lines of GTRL BAT LUL. Right. So okay. So it's n it's not correct. Does it affect data structure? Oh yeah, of course, because we have land for time span, but we don't have causal array yet in this uh, in this Okay, um, makes sense, it's because the operations are specified incorrectly. We make an assumption that doesn't get encoded in the operation itself, but an index can always be initially identified elsewhere and thus be different from the causal intent. So that's another issue. But it's interesting to think that this causal array represents allows to fix this um, this aspect of the intent with something that um, that we then calls uh, where is it again it is that oh yeah the most intuitive mode we could expect and and the fact that the causal array solves that is because it actually helps encode the fact that when site two wrote Dell it was seeing CMV and the causal array puts that in the data structure. So I just love that 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 sort of um, thing right there. Um, and I think the whole idea with one and that applies in Thomas world is that you can use this as a principle to actually compose uh, CRDTs. And I didn't even show this in um, Data, data, um, um, website for the one data page, which is that there is a composition page in there, which hints at the fact that you can build one RDT data types by combining them together. So it's a kind of, I mean, it's a kind of like algebraic uh, composition technique for like one data type, and that. Uh, anything that looks like an order collection can be um, modeled with an RGA. Anything that looks like an order an order collection can be used modeled using an R set, which is another CRDT. Uh, RGA is the causal tree that we use in there using this array for for the order. R set because it doesn't use that is able to be smarter um, or maybe more concise in the underlying data type, and then the product type, and you can use a left right ring for fields and that uh, doing so you're able to compose um, a bigger CRDT right based on smaller CRDTs and that's pretty awesome and that's definitely one of the things that I want to play with 
uh, with PureScript because I'm um, really interested in this how we can lift regular average data types into the system strategy and the homework pipelines. Okay, so what was I talking about? I was looking at this and talking about composition, right? Um, yeah. So where are we? Um, we introduce arrows here, right? Yeah. Um, first step is to fix the hiccup of the problem. Treat other operation as an implicit contract and define many maps of itself. Fundamentally, insert a at index zero isn't really what the user wants to do, but rather insert a as the output v i v. Well, if it's lateral in the array, simply is uniquely identified. Yes. So. So that's what we we were doing here. Uh, and then the, the question is, where is this after arrow stored in A and B? Given cause order, and assume that delete the character for sequence here in an operation that works in parallel clusters. That's an interesting thing to know. Uh, the instance of these operations in an array can be visible. So that one is B, that one should still be in the array. And then in S we are reposition A just as the user intended. So how do we identify partial or lateral? Just A and B are indeed indeed the case here. So we need a new ID for it and save it as lateral. This is the the entropy uh, we have in each one step as you are identifying the operation. One may use the operation identifier that passes to the output. In other words, an insert A operation could stand without particular letter A when referenced by other operations. Now, no extra properties is required and everything is perfectly fine in terms of our original attempt in each of the operations. Yeah, I mean, no extra data is required. Um, except the data for the arrow, right? Um, this is interesting because we had it before, we got now get some data about the extra symbols to create an array correctly ordered and even preserving perhaps a rank as desired. But here's an interesting issue. We scan the output array with two total and squares, we just start Knowing that graph is at all the quotient and deletions tend to be all wrong. Uh, da, da, da. And then next we declare an entire array of three and we will return this command. Or when recreating the output array from scratch, uh, push on up. On the other hand, our model will not work. Now, what if instead of creating our entire operation array at all quotient ends, we position operations in the order of their output? It can be done by placing each operation to the right of its cover operation, then sorting in reverse timestamp to allow the output among the remaining operations. In fact, this could cause the operation array to mirror the structure of the output array. So we got this data that output can be preferred to the speed of the output array, but yeah, it seems to be incorrect. So here we have a uh, site one out of 60 RL. Um, Site one was a C and a Z, and then um, and then site one uh, deleting the Z, and then deleting I don't know um, six seven. Uh, oh yeah, no, there's only two deletes. So. Um, Site one deleting M, uh, that's the wrong order. Uh, this is T6, and this is T7, T I'm pretty sure. Well, here it's under the six and seven, but I would assume that it was the, the, there wasn't a move of the cursor in, in between. They probably deleted the Z first and then the M. Um, but I guess it's consistent. Let's say that that's what's going on. Um, yeah, and then uh, and then site uh, two was an array, and site three was uh, a i t, and then uh, site one uh, was uh, was um, an array. 
it's also interesting to think of this arrow representing a cursor and that will be interesting especially when we think of um, comodics and the comodic structure of I mean a common ODK API on this uh, with the cursor uh, being represented and wondering how that's going to work um, and I'm wondering whether we can extend the idea of a common ODK cursor to the idea of a causal arrow and I was thinking of fuzzy in my head but it feels related um, to me mm -hmm. Is this new order local operation required data backstop processing when the data is stored to backstop? Indeed. Um, instead of a simply coming to the back, they have to first locate their parent and find that spot in order to run the operation. Uh, yeah, right. Is that still an answer? Um, well, um, well, it depends at which time these different things arrive. But so this is supposed to be the time at which each of these things arrive. I'm not sure, this doesn't feel like the right order. Uh, at, at least it's not the order of, a, of conquest. Maybe it's the order of, of ways um, before conquest is an answer. Um, da -da -da -da. Instead of simply coming to the back, they have to first locate their parent and then find their spot in order to run the operation. Then instead of a run, in return for listing the output of order, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you can give the solution to an order, I will take the spot. Okay, so it's kind of like a an anticipation strategy. So then in that way, but you put some of the cost in the right and some of the cost in the lead. In fact, you can almost treat this operation as, all, as if it were the string itself, uh, even though in size is only the backing stage of the functional operation. And this is things such as uh, the sum performance paradox. And this is definitely where chromophore goes, but I can take a step further. But um, my core question there was, um, where do we maintain the reference? And um, and whether there's something that comes out naturally um, out of this structure, which means that we don't need to actually explicitly store, for instance, explicitly this value right there it could be that if we only store this arrow then this arrow because it's at the end is implied exactly and is that so let's look at what alpha six looks like when uh, we add a bunch of other things in the back then when we add this this will have uh, no it doesn't need to because I mean, the from the tree perspective, um, when this doesn't have a, it doesn't. No, it's not true. Because the fact that this, um, let's try and draw. I was thinking of this as here the the end of that branch. have two um, two running examples yeah I try to reproduce also this example at the same time as the linked example using this notation and I mean to complete this I kind of need to not just represent this because it's actually here but also represent all these four things so I'll just get rid of that um, alpha is print and is something like alpha one
telling you that um, I know I should have learned to speak this by this way or how to speak the way that I speak it, but I think I've called it. I've, I've actually, um, yeah, it actually it does make a lot of sense to say that this is learned uh, at outside. Maybe I could add a word to that. Let me try. Let's see if I can try it. So we don't have to say that this is happening at outside, this is at back in Poland. And then um, in beta, I would want to call this beta in fact. not the same data structure, I'm using a different data structure, I'm a different principle, and I'm just using a different syntactic script, but don't worry. Right, uh, that beta server is there. This is indeed outside the path of it. So I, I like this representation. Um, this is a seven, sorry, my mistake. And this is an eight five. So I would call beta an eight five. I could also call this T beta eight. I like that. So you see T1 alpha T2 alpha and so on and so on and uh, yeah this would be a three okay and I'm not gonna tell you where I was right now because I haven't done the rest of the code but I do want to have this other example which uh, is TMG or is that a separate that is TMG mm -hmm. so that's our alpha I'm not sure I should have done that uh, yeah that's not great because we don't need to take away this and this might not be full we might want to call this something else yeah, actually that's that's probably not a separate class. So it's better to say that T T L and L. So T L seven alpha T eight alpha and so on. T eight L seven. Is that uh, uh yeah, what is alpha seven now? The same except in the, the no it's not uh, yeah it's not going to be that uh, that in depth because we i think in the example we will see i mean it's not clear actually what is the order of synchronization uh, whereas in this example you see uh, that uh, alpha received the beta synchronization and then um, received the gamma version after beta received it okay um, see that in this diagram and I don't know whether um, but I think we can um, we can recapture the intention of the author here uh, by looking at the timestamps but um, so let's uh, let's grab the beta case and the gamma case so far this data is not quite clear and quite clean and so we have um, right so we have a uh, site 2 actually um, yeah, actually, site two started in TMG, and then we have right seven in beta, and uh, the LLM that is beta 
Okay. Press the start. Does and go up and then go in. And then we'll do our scene. So here we call this 056 if we are to use the local indexer. And mm, it's, it's actually it's interesting, right? Because this notation sort of says something about, about these arrows, about when things were received. This is nice. Um, because if this is called 456 and this is called 456, um, then it means that they were done simultaneously without my intent to, to tell it. But uh, let's check whether that gives us a semantic clue which it wasn't. So I think this is really the order in which is it? What is that order system? Um, the notation array about some unique key, the multiple key pair of are we receiving this? Site contact string is used. Send it just to site two and three. Then reinitiated me. And site two and three then make the un then make the own change and send them back to site one to see my error. Okay, so let's try and call in those semantics. So site one sent to site one sent to site four. I think that's the proper semantic that I've written right there, actually which is that it's um, site point, site contact string is used. So that's alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. Oh, yeah, I am talking. Uh, am I not being heard? <laughs> that, that, that's, yeah, I was moving away from the microphone. Hi, I'm Hap. Thanks for letting me know. I hope that's better. Oh, do I sound like that? Yes, that's because I have a, um, uh, how do you call it? A, a gate, a noise gate, and uh, when I'm not talking in front of the microphone, like I'm hopefully doing correctly now, then the noise gate is doing some crazy, crazy thing. But there's also crazy, th crazy noises happening in the background, like right now. So it's in the mix of both. Yeah, like that, for instance. Right? Okay. Um, so let me know, please. I won't help if um, if this is sounding better at least my voice i'm sorry if there's still some uh, some noises but um but uh, yeah let's continue right so alpha one alpha two alpha three is what uh, site one writes right uh, site one for us we call it alpha and then um send it changes to site two and site three which means that beta in its own chronic way uh, gets alpha one alpha two alpha three the same unit and so does gamma tell me hi Evolion. all right um let's see how could i do that oh yeah maybe i didn't uh, oh yeah i see now i see uh there you go that must uh, be day and night right because uh <laughs> i had uh, i had i had my my uh Streamlabs volume completely down. I, uh, I'm actually my headphones are not as listening to the source that goes into Streamlabs, not to the outside of that. Um, yeah, I will fix that sometime, but hopefully this is now good. Um, thank you, one hack for letting me know. <laughs> yeah, you can hear me now. Yay, we did it. Thank you. Thanks for the collaboration. Okay. Um, Wow, that's cool. I did a whole stream with my volume completely turned down. Uh, and so, um, well, hey, that's it just happens, right? Uh, okay, so let's uh, let's continue. Or maybe let's go back. Should I, should, uh, I mean, just let me know if you want me, if you like empty streams. <laughs> that's good. Hey, that is that a functional programming pun? because empty streams don't exist right you can have an empty list but uh, you can't have an empty stream as a data structure 
Um, nice one. Okay, um, alpha. Um, mm, mm, mm. Right. What was I saying? Okay, so I'm, I'm going through this um, example. You know, your C plus plus. Nice, nice. And um, I don't, I don't know my C plus plus by the way. Just, uh, just so you know. But um, and I know a little bit of my pure script, and that's what I'm trying to do now. Um, implement the chronofold paper in pure script is what I'm looking at. So, um, bum, bum, bum. right. So, site one, type CMD. We have this here. Send these changes to site two and three. So, alpha one, two, three are received by beta and are received by gamma. Uh, this chrono thingy is a CRDT. It's a um, conflict-free replicated data type uh, for version text. So like uh, maybe you've heard of the OT approach, operational transforms that Google Docs uses. They think they use a, a variation of that uh, based on Wood with a central server to coordinate writes in Google Docs. And um, well, there's research ongoing on on this approach to uh, you know real time sync between data structures, and um, a, a researcher and his co-author uh, Grichenko and Patrakev have um, come up quite recently uh, with uh, this chronofold structure, which is um, the best of um, uh, state of the art in terms of replicated data types and a uh, low-level efficient data structure for text storage. So um, I was pointing to this uh, uh, blog post from uh, Microsoft on VS Code. Uh, the benefits are um, basically... Um, so So there's a few things that uh, in the, the problem space and the solution space, um, you you know you want your data structure to be correct by construction, right? That's one of the things you want from your CRDTs. And so there's two different approaches to that, like the convergent or op-based CRDT and the commutative or state-based CRDT. Oh, I actually have reversed them. And uh, they 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 occupy different points, uh, different areas in the solution space, and um, they're like um, you know, um, w <laughs> calling them wars is maybe a little bit strong, but there's you know uh, discussions on which ones are really the best that industry should adopt, and. Uh, and so you can look that up. Um, I'm actually not very conversant in where the state of the art in discussing the pros and cons of these things are. Uh, but there's a lot of, you know, uh, both uh, great YouTube videos on the subject and, um, you know, hacker news debates on this. Um, and um, and um, and that weigh the pros and cons. And some of them are about correctness and how I think OT, um, which is um, operational-based uh, CRDTs, have this reputation that maybe they're harder to develop with, um, I think. But th you have different properties of what you want out of your network underneath as well, because here you you um, uh, what do you, yeah you need the operations to be commutative, um, but you don't need them to be idempotent. And the fact that you don't need them to be idempotent mean that you can have a communication infrastructure that um, am I correct here? I think that that they can do they they can duplicate messages. Uh, no, that's that's the reverse. That if your CRDT is happy with is has idempotent operations, then you can have a, a network that delivers those operations sometimes multiple times and your your CRDT is still fine and correct. Uh, whereas if you have a uh, an operation-based CRDT, then you need your communication infrastructure to ensure that all operations on a replica are delivered to the other replicas without duplication, but in any, any order. Um, and so you don't have that requirement with state-based CRDT because you can deliver uh, 
messages several times. So uh, it's um, a little bit about what your underlying messaging infrastructure will look like, uh, whether it, it can have some kind of guarantees around, uh, well, not, none of these require ordering guarantees, but they do require delivery guarantees. It's always amazing to see something advanced to ground me into expressing that I still have much to learn. My knowledge is still not a lot compared to people like, oh, that's really sweet. But, uh, you know, it's like everything else. It's like, you know, the more time you spend on the thing, uh, the more you start to kind of, you know, get the details. And I feel like I don't get a lot of details compared to uh, to the people that are uh, that are better than me at it. So uh, thanks. Uh, I appreciate that. And um, yeah, so that's one of the things, one of the differences. And then there's some other interesting difference, which is that some people would say that it's easier for the programmer to basically screw things up um, with one type versus the other. And it seemed like I think OT was notorious, notoriously um, notorious for um, allowing more uh, um, problems to be introduced by the developers, whereas um, state-based CRDT are actually easier. But I think there's a performance trade-off. So, you know, it's like, it's a complicated decision to make. Um, and then on top of that, you know, like as this, um, this blog post uh, talks about, um, even a simple thing like this text uh, buffer in there in VS Code, which is actually what this uh, Log uh, article is about this can be also optimized, uh, you know, uh, optimized pretty, pretty, uh, pretty hard, and some of that relates to things like you know, um, you don't want things to be an array because then if you copy something in the middle, then you need to shift your whole memory, and that's really long. And so you want data structure that actually are going to always append at the end. But then obviously you want your thing to be really efficient to display on screen. And then also when you do like tons of processing passes on the same text, like, you know, not just to display the characters, but also maybe to, you know, detect indentation and then, you know, do things like parsing for highlighting, syntax highlighting and whatnot, then all of that leads to wanting data structure that, you know, are more and more optimized to all of these use cases. And then people that are going even further in the optimization uh, direction then will even think about how your data structure performs on modern CPUs and whether, you know, your, your CPU is able to cache properly things uh, at, at its, you know, at, at its uh, uh, very low level caches. So, you know, that stuff is super magic. Uh, and, but it's incredible, you know, you can have incredible performance gains by choosing the right data structure. And so that's what these guys did with uh, VS Code. And um, the reason I talk about this is because this chronofold thing is basically exactly the mix between the best of CRTTs and the best of text buffer data structures. So it's, um, um, yeah, that's why I'm interested in it because it seems like that's, that's a nice uh, space to explore. And um, right now there's only uh, a public implementation in Rust. And um, because I like uh, strongly typed uh, functional programming, I'm starting to implement it in PureScript. Um, also because PureScript uh, compiles down to JavaScript. And if you have JavaScript, then you have all browsers in the world as a runtime. And that's really neat. Uh, it means that you can programs that I write in this program, uh, in this programming language could be executed uh, in, inside the browser. And so it means that I can now have, you know, something like a Google Docs that's distributed, that doesn't need a central server, and that performs really well. So that's the kind of the, you know, kind of the motivation. And then the other motivation is that, you know, I just kind of want to learn. And this is my first uh, software engineering stream as well. Uh, so welcome to that. And, um, and yeah, I thought, uh, sometimes it's useful for researchy things to think out loud and then, you know, uh, why not stream it? So, um, so what I was doing now is that there's something I don't understand about the, in the paper, which is a kind of a detail if you like, but it's really one of the key detail of this overall approach for CRDTs and the overall approach is known as CT or causal trees or RGA for, I think, replicated growable arrays which is what the prior state of the art for text style CRDT was. So uh, 
to get everyone synchronized in real time with a text buffer, then that's the kind of the approach that you would use. And RG for uh, um, a more, uh, in the, it fits in the bigger categories of anything that needs ordering. When you when you have data structures like text, right, the, the order matters, right, um, as opposed to a set where there's no real ordering. In a, in, a, in a string, you have an order. And where people do things in that order, whether they, you know, they, they insert a backspace just uh, um, after the M, it means that the M is going to be deleted. And so, you know, that ordering matters. And then if you have several people modifying that same string at the same time, then that's when CRDTs shine. They guarantee you to have the same results on all of the participant uh, machine. And so that's really what we want. And that's what Chronofold does. And I was uh, earlier in the stream uh, with a very uh, tiny volume. I was uh, um, rewriting exactly that example. That's actually not in the paper, but that's a kind of step-by-step -step view of um, what happens with this Chronofold data structure for three different computers, Alpha, Beta, and Gamma. Uh, when one computer has uh, written Pinsk, and then uh, the, uh, this computer is called Alpha, and then computer Beta receives that exact Pinsk thing, and then starts modifying it, and then Gamma receives it too and modifies it at the same time, which is exactly the type of things that you want to make sure your CRDT is able to, to manage correctly, um, which is called a conflict, which is why CRDT is a conflict-free replicated data type. Hey, good. I'm glad that you do. Um, don't hesitate to ask questions if there's something I can do to make it click for you. Uh, but I think, to, you know, this is what made it click for me. So that's why I'm going back to it. And that's also why I like writing it uh, in my code and, um, and why I was uh, also rewriting this other example uh, that's a bit earlier. So it doesn't use this uh, more modern technique, but it's the same principle. So, um, so the way that the magic actually happens and the way that these three things are going to converge are uh, based on the fact that we don't not only store where characters are in on, on screen, but we also store the fact that um, where the basically where the cursor was for everyone um, and what everyone was seeing uh, when they started typing. And so uh, the fact that we um, have beta seven here means that actually uh, when beta started typing uh, backspace here, it had seen all of this alpha stuff up to alpha six. So that's the key. Yeah, from a network perspective, you could say that, that there's something about latency and synchronization. Yeah. Um, so here, um, beta, um, and the first step, beta receives exactly alpha six. So you see that, uh, uh, um, so through the network, beta receives alpha six. Oh, something I should say, if you're couching the system of a uh, network, is that this whole thing also works offline. And that's the great thing about it, is that, you know, if gamma is disconnected and then reconnects like days after and and talks to alpha and beta, it, it'll be able to uh, to synchronize back. And so that's really cool. And, um, right. So, um, right. So, at this step, uh, beta receives exactly what alpha sent it, and ga gamma also received the same thing. So around uh, before this time, um, the three replicas, alpha, beta, gamma, now hold exactly the same state, alpha 6. And then beta starts writing two things, uh, beta 7 and beta 8, and those things are a backspace and a capital M. And the backspace actually affects P. So it, it occurs after P. And that's one of the key things in that Chronofold data structure is that uh, new things that are added remember what, um, what was seen as well as where, um, where it occurred. And I just realized that this was a little bit confused in my, in my mind, in fact, because I thought the arrow was the causal arrow, but that's not exactly true. The, causal, the, the arrow is the cursor but the causality actually is the is the numbering it's the fact that beta is called beta 7 because and the 7 here indicates that it's after the 6 
that it received from the alpha. And if you look at gamma, um, the, the, the idea here is that beta does something, gamma does something, and they, they don't know about each other until later. And so while, um, while uh, beta writes Minsk like this, by doing backspace M, uh, gamma does Pinsk, but lowercase, lowercase Pinsk by uh, deleting four times, um, after deleting four times, but uh, after K here, and then uh, writing for lowercase character INSK. And so gamma does this at gamma seven, which means that it did this after seeing alpha six. And so here you can Im immediately see that beta, the fact that beta seven and gamma, there's a beta seven and a gamma seven mean that they're basically doing something sort of at the same time, right? Which is kind of conceptually here in this diagram meant by these sort of parallel arrows. And the specificity, specificity of a chronofall is that they will, uh, each replica might have stuff in a different order in their, in their local data structure, but they're all able to interpret it down to the same final result, which is all of the other stuff that happens afterwards. And so if you look closely here, you see that alpha has alpha 6, beta 8, gamma 14, and beta has alpha 6, beta 8, gamma 14, while gamma has alpha 6, gamma 14, beta 8. And so it means that gamma uh, in its local chronofold has its own gamma 14 stuff first. So the whole four backspaces and four lower caps uh, insk thing, and then has the beta 8. Whereas both beta and alpha, because of when they receive their synchronization, actually have the, the beta modification first. They have the backspace capital M first, and then they have all of that gamma stuff afterwards. But the key with this, with this chronofall data structure is the algorithm that's going to make it so that those three things, even if they're different on each of these different replicas, are going to be basically rendered to exactly the Locally. same text here. So that's pretty cool, and that's the that's the thing. And so what I was now looking at and trying to understand is, okay, how this thing implemented, right? And there's the Rust implementation, but um, it feels like it's using slightly different uh, terminology than the paper. And then the paper talks specifically about what needs to be basically in uh, in this data structure right that they're basically arrays uh, but then the question is arrays of what and then you know obviously there's an array with some character value there but there are also arrays with kind of a replica uh, annotation and a, like a sort of a time uh, annotation and whatnot right uh, trying to uh, make the three ds interpret different ds to make one ds Yes, data structure. Yes, uh, you could say that. They, yeah, I, I like the, the idea of interpreting. I think that that's the correct way to, to think of it. It's like, even though they are written in a different order, they interpret to the same thing. And the fact that you have this magic given to you by the algorithm mean that you effectively have a conflict-free replicated data type because you can guarantee, uh, although... I don't know whether there is a formal proof of this yet. You know, some of, for the, some of these algorithms, sometimes you have a, you need formal mathematical proofs. But I think maybe there is a formal proof of uh, CT actually, and this is just uh, an extension of CT. Let's see if there is a causal tree formal proof. I don't think there is yet. So that's that's an interesting thing. New vistas on causal tree methods from both cause. No, so that's something else. Yeah, uh, causality is actually something that's used also in statistics. But anyway, um, yes, that's where the magic is. Is that even though there's uh, three different data structures, over, although alpha and beta arguably uh, are in the same order, right? Even though they're stored in in different machines, that uh, because all of them ren render to the same Minsk, um, then you know. Basically, there's no observable differences, is what you could say. And so it means, in practice, that everybody sees the same thing on screen. And that's exactly what you want. And more than that, actually, and that's explained uh, in this article. Uh, and this article explains um, basically the how this, the, how the, 
the, the, the algorithm called causal trees work and chronofold is a, a, an improvement on causal tree it's formally it is a causal tree data structure but um, it's making a bunch of improvement to be efficient for text buffers um, so this article is from 2018 so it's a little bit before but it explains it pretty well it, it explains that you want the most intuitive merge that you can expect and it explains that by saying you know here you know, if you have three sites, and so I was in the process of using the same notation as uh, as is used here for um, for this example, just to wrap my head around it, right? So, um, what does it mean? The most intuitive merge. Well, it means that uh, in if you do something a little bit naively, uh, then you could end up with something like C T R L D A T L E L. And so actually, you know, by, by doing it, like the first the first idea that he uses in his article, uh, it kind of works. Everybody's going to see C-T-R-L-D-A-T-L-E-L, -E -L, but that's kind of, you know, uh, that's not really what you want. You, ideally, you'd want to have C-T-R-L-A-L-T-D-E-L. -L. Uh, so in this example, it's a bit like a variant on our Pinsk-Minsk uh, example here. Um, site one writes CMD, and so, um, I called site one alpha again here. And so alpha one, alpha two, alpha three are CMD. And um, site, so type, uh, that's the sentence, site one type CMD, and then sends it changes to site two and site three. So that means that now uh, beta has also alpha one, alpha two, alpha three, and, but it's called CMD. And then gamma has uh, also CMD. And you can see here, I've annotated the, the the times with the sites where they're at. And that's part of the beauty of uh, causal trees and something that is said also somewhat here is like a, a chronofold, I think even a, a causal tree is a subjectively ordered log. So it means that each instance has its own subjective order, right? And which is the same trick as having beta 8 gamma 14 here or gamma 14 beta 8 there. And uh, same thing here. Um, um, same thing here in my notation. I say that uh, CMD uh, on the replica alpha is um, is at you know you, we have a C at the slot one alpha. So it's the subjective time for alpha, and actually subjective time for beta uh, will be uh, one beta, and it will have also C, but it carries the fact that this comes from alpha one, and that's part of the Part of the whole tracing where things come from or more precisely uh, what things looked like when you started acting on it that's really the, the key intuition there is that here for instance beta we're saying that it had seen cmd when it started to type del and that's why it's uh, it's uh, um, index is beta 4 because it comes after this alpha 3. And what is said here by the fact that we have gamma for is that actually same thing. Gamma started typing ALT after it had seen CMD. So, um, so, so then we continue. And then uh, site one types this thing and then resumes its editing, which means that it then starts typing, uh, it, it starts deleting MND and then typing TRL. So that's what I captured here. So. Uh, uh, alpha basically also same thing alpha continues typing because at this point in the sentence it doesn't tell us that alpha knows anything about site two and three or in our in our world beta and gamma and so alpha four here is the backspace oh actually i made a mistake here there's two backspaces for uh for proper um for proper uh replication of this example so we have 9 alpha here and alpha 9 here right so alpha types one backspace a second backspace backspace just after that and then types oh no not ctrl just trl okay so now i think i finally fixed the example and then what happens then site 2 and 3 make their own changes so that we've done they make their own changes so in parallel so in this diagram that would mean like parallel uh, arrows and 
uh, and then send them back to site one for the final merge. So in truth, it means that in this final merge, really what we have is also not only site one receiving beta and gamma, as mentioned here, but also beta and gamma receiving, you know, uh, all of the other people's, uh, all the other replicas' um, edits, right? So that's where things become interesting because it actually doesn't specify in which order. This only specifies that site one receives stuff from site two and three, but it doesn't specify in which order it does. Whereas in Chronofold like there, we were paying attention to this. So we'll have to add some, uh, add some detail to, to this example. All these things happen in milliseconds, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, all these things happen with network lat latency if those replicas are on different machines. That's correct. Um, in the in the paper, um, the author talks about uh, processes that each machine is a process. So you could maybe imagine that actually inside the same machine, some uh, different apps are actually synchronizing data in this way, and so then it would be you know sub millisecond like just process uh, exchanging um, exchanging data in that way. Uh, and yes, the other advantage um, is, and so the time that it takes is actually interesting that you have the time to receive the payload from another um, replica, right? And so that's network latency. And then you have the latency for, um, for the algorithm itself, right? And so I don't know exactly what the complexity uh, is supposed to be. Um, um, is it Oren Logan? Um, let's see. So you're, you're only receiving the diff, right? You're only receiving um, like really the minimum amount of things that you're supposed to receive. So that's really great for in terms of the, uh, the bandwidth. Major downside I would say is just that it's really new. You know, it's recently come off uh, academia. There's a there's not a lot of libraries necessarily for it. I think uh, React was one of the uh, more industry players. Um, React here that uh, implemented CRDT data types. So see that now there's Redis and Cosmos DB. Um, so it's just not very widely available. So you know, the, it means that the libraries are not necessarily very mature, and it means that uh, you don't. Um, um, that you know you need to have a lot of explaining to do to your colleagues if you want to you know uh, deploy that inside your own app um, because they might not know the technique because it's fairly new but that being said you know uh, look 2011 so you know it depends what you what you call new sometimes things move fast um, it's also in the in the domain of uh, strong eventual consistency so you know that's something that in distributed databases is more well known so you know things like uh, uh, Cassandra, um, even Kafka, uh, you know, like the semantics of a data store, whether it's, you know, has uh, eventual consistency or not, all of these things matter, but all of that is also fairly new and it comes with its own subtleties in terms of what you expect of your database uh, when you deploy it for, let's say, you know, a, an online store or something, right? Um, so all of these things are fairly new using the method of explaining this stuff at different timelines could be more understandable. Right, right. I think, actually, you know what? That's uh, that's something called a sequence diagram, right? I'm just putting it on its uh, on its side and I'm just following the what uh, Chronofold is doing. I mean, this, right? But uh, then, uh, w what's interesting is I was seeing that there's some things missing in here. I mean, this diagram in, in itself is complete, but you kind of need an introduction to it. Uh, yeah, and you probably saw diagrams like this before, right? And uh, yeah, things like this. So that's really some of the formal stuff where you have, uh, you know, for me with the alpha, beta, gamma, and they send messages to each other and, uh, and then something happens. And then just to finish my answer um, uh, to your question about the, the millisecond thing is that, yeah, you have the cost of the merge algorithm itself. And then uh, the fact that then you need to render the uh, render the change on screen. So all of these things are uh, 
Um, that's exactly what this data structure is optimized for, whereas previous work in, uh, in this data structure wasn't optimized for making sure that this stuff is going to be displayed very fast on your screen. And in fact, I got to say something I haven't said yet on screen, but I'm really interested in whether this stuff could be implemented in the GPU, because these days you can accelerate uh, rendering a lot by delegating your computation to the CPU. So really been thinking about whether that stuff could be um, either compiled um, in a, uh, into some shader language uh, so that, you know, all of your computation, you basically, you know, you, you receive data from the network, your CPU just passes it on to your GPU, the GPU does all of this merging stuff for you and then poof, renders it directly uh, from memory on the GPU. That stuff would be super fast. Yeah, having that for the GPU, I, I think that that would be a, an interesting and ambitious thing to do. As far as I know, um, I haven't seen even some of the more simple, simple data structure for text buffers being implemented in the GPU itself. Um, let's, let's take a look at it. Like a, so this technique is called a piece table, and it's implemented with a red-black tree there, uh, specifically optimized for line model. Uh, let's see if there's a piece table for GPU. I'm pretty sure I've done this research before. Um, let's see, piece table, GPU, GPU accelerated, GPU accelerated, high optimized text editor. Well, you see, some people think about that stuff, uh, but I don't know if it's done in the GPU. Uh, piece table, data structure called piece table, that's ideas you search. The Visual Studio could use as a data structure. Rope is one of the other uh, potential data structure for this type of thing. Um, note that this is not CRDT. This is all plain old simple uh, piece table. And even that, oh, 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 oh. Visual Studio cost terminal terminal is GPU accelerated. Okay, so that's not that's not the that's not the text data structure, but that's GPU accelerated. Interesting. This stuff is beyond you, but it's nice to understand the extremes basic. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, it's it's a stretch for me as well, right? I mean, I'm just interested in playing a, a keyword bingo or buzzword bingo, right? I'm like, okay, oh, you know, look, there's a super fast implementation of uh, of uh, text editors that's called uh, Peace Table. And then look, there's a super modern view to do CRDT, to, to do a replicated, um, data structure that's called CRDT. And then look, Chronofold actually does both. And now I'm adding the GPU <laughs> the GPU uh, buzzword into the mix thinking, wouldn't that be nice if you also had, uh, if it also worked in the GPU. Um, but look, yeah, they seem to be doing stuff in there that's uh, connected to, to GPU. I don't know how they do that. Maybe it's only for the the character rendering texture atlas this yeah this sounds like uh, stuff that you'd use for um for just character rendering optimization not for um obviously maybe not for like having the whole piece table inside your gpu memory i don't know whether they do that or not see why data scientists get paid a ton yeah 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 senior uh, senior engineers in in some cases really do uh Really can have a can have a ten x uh, you know leverage uh, factor when they when they think about problems or write uh, write code indeed. Hey, thanks for the follow. Really appreciate it. I just uh, I installed that 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 stuff uh, recently, and I realized that I actually don't need to repeat your questions because they're written on screen. I also only installed this in my last uh, quiet stream because everything was uh, turned down uh, like today. Um, yeah, so that's cool stuff, and um, and yeah, yeah. Something I haven't mentioned even before is that actually there is a prior art in trying to mix those two things, and that's work that Atom did, uh, but it's been um, it's been shelved by uh, GitHub, and that was exactly the same, and uh, the, yeah, exactly the same. Uh, no, not exactly the same approach, but it was the the current or the the, the at the time, the state of the art in mixing a CRDT technique with uh, a, uh, an optimized data structure for text rendering in Atom. 
um, but they ended up shelving it. Um, yeah, so it's uh, it's interesting stuff. And uh, maybe I should uh, actually do a little copy tab thing. And um, yeah, by the way, uh, one hack if you're still around, um, one thing I will do when I'm done is that I will post these little show notes uh, probably, um, well, I'm not sure where I'll post these show notes yet. Um, because I couldn't find, maybe you know that, I couldn't find a way to uh, get all of this um, uh, Twitch stuff. Oh no, that's not true. I did find that it went to the About section. Yeah, there's this About section thing here. Um, and I've put some stuff in there, so maybe I'll Maybe I'll, at least I'll put the link on the about section. So in just in case, you know, later in the uh, later in your life, you think, hey, I want to watch the stream that talked about that stuff. And then uh, you'll be happy to find links to some of the stuff that I was talking about, in addition to the stream, which I'll probably post uh, on YouTube as well. And um, yeah. And so I'll probably post that stuff also in the YouTube comments, although it's not very markdown friendly. Whereas uh, Twitch is markdown friendly. Anyway, let's um, get back to my attempt to represent this example on this blog post with this notation. So um, last time I was last thing I was saying was that here it says we reach a turnaround, take a little three people get a million crop tabs and take with get a million crop tabs. I, yeah, I yeah, I got a million Chrome tabs. Um, got a million Chrome tabs on this computer, got a million Chrome tabs in the other computer. And, and, you know, I'm thinking about how I can synchronize these million Chrome tabs or make sure that, you know, they, they're part of a history that is not locked inside the browser history, but that I can parse and or like read and share later when I think, hey, what was that thing that I saw? And not necessarily have to go and and, and trust the browser search history to do that, especially if I've been doing it on, on my mobile phone as opposed to my several machines, right? So then what's the synchronization and what if I use a different browser? There's not a lot of good solutions to search through that as a timeline. I mean, there are a few solutions, but then they're not very principled. And I think that with this whole CRDT thing, you could do that actually. <laughs> another, another million, yeah. Another, a few a few more millions to be honest uh, you know i um again i'll show you something this uh um you know this log thing this practice i i've started to do logs daily and now I've, i'm starting to do this for for my stream as well but i've been doing this now for a bit more than a year I, every day i work on this personal project I'm, I'm trying to make sure that i that i write logs and what i've been doing once in a while and you'll see this uh Let's say it will come, it will come. Okay, maybe I need to go a little bit later. Oh God. Ah, here, tabs. And check this out. And this is basically me deciding, okay, I got too many tabs open. I need to close a bunch. And so, and remember that somewhere because I don't want to lose them really, right? And so, I, I, obviously, when do you think I start uh, doing that? <laughs> when my computer starts uh, being upset with me because I got a million tabs open. <laughs> so, yeah, it's fun. It's fun stuff. I think it's um, it can qualify as hoarding. I think, but um, but it's also because you just simply. I mean, that's my case. I simply uh, want to make sure that I. I that something remembers when I was w reading that stuff, and um, and the browser functions don't do it well enough for me. So, so yeah. <laughs> and uh, all right, um, let's see. No CPU killer now. No, right now it's fine. I think CPU is doing okay, even though I'm I'm on a really old machine. Um, and I'm streaming, see, 50%, I think that's, that, that's okay. All right, um, back to pure script. And this example. 
make change. Uh, right. So what I was saying is that the example is actually not precise enough. Is that it just says that site one receive uh, receive that things are sent back from site two and three for final merge to site one. But it doesn't say what happened to site two and three, and it doesn't say in which order uh, site one receives the changes. So let's uh, do some interpretation here and say that it receives um, beta stuff first and then the alpha stuff first. So what would it be like? Uh, we're on alpha, so the time, the, the time indexes are annotated with alpha. And we receive something that is actually a D, right? Um, and uh, it's this D, so it's beta for D. So beta for. But the thing we didn't write in here, which is important, is um, that is the arrow. And the arrow is, I mean, not the arrow of how things are distributed, but uh, the arrow of where this D occurred. And that arrow is actually represented here. And I, it's really useful for me to have been going through all that stuff because it makes me realize that I was a little bit confused in my mind with the... the um, what I thought in my mind was a causal arrow between here and here, meaning that beta occurs after after six. And it means that there's an implicit arrow here. That's kind of a time arrow in my mind. But there's also just the arrow of where the stuff occurred. And that's more related to a cursor. So let's think a bit about how we represent this. I think it's just that um, we decide if we um, point to, um, we're basically pointing to alpha one. There's, a, there's numbers of ways to encode this, but let's let's say it's, let's call it maybe cursor, cursor after or something. Different interpretations. Yeah, you know, the fact that I'm now going to be also trying to write some code means that I need to sort of have a vocabulary for it that is consistent. And, you know, it needs to be consistent, especially in my mind. And so it it means that, you know, the, the paper's author's mind, I'm, I'm not sure whether I can completely follow. And so some of these things I'm going to need to simplify for myself. Um, and so here, um, yeah, arrow could mean several things, right? And um, and so here I'm thinking that this D, and let me write it for for um, for um, the original example. The original example says that, and we actually don't have any um, um, cursor or whatever. I'm not super happy with the name because it's so long. Um, and right here. We're saying that this happens uh, after after um, after after alpha two. <laughs> yeah. By the way, I'm just realized that this is using um, uh, one indexed arrays. Well, we have a zero here, um, but uh, oh well. See ya, one hack. Thanks for being around. Uh, really cool. I think, by the way, you helping me <laughs> raise the volume and then explain that stuff again is awesome because it means that at least some of the stuff that I was doing to explain uh, at the beginning uh, is now re-explained with proper sound. So thanks a lot. And see you later. Um, okay, so alpha two here means um, so in this scenario. I'm not doing what the author suggests, which is that I'm storing the reference to the previous thing inside um, inside this. But that's the whole thing we wanted to figure out, right? It's it's not the is it the whole thing we're trying to figure out? I'm a little bit confused because then if we say okay, if we follow the author. And we don't say after, but we say, how do we call it here? Um, actually, calling it follow would be a, maybe a nice, uh, more simple way to to uh, name it. 
because follow I mean it could be time a time following um, but um, a it, it works well with a character following a meaning as well and so yeah the operation following alpha 1 in the weave a subject the ordered log of tuple where the value is the operation following right 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 so um, so it would be followed by that's that's how you would centered center the thing um, onto the element of the data structure that you're looking at that this thing is followed by a thing and so if we do that here then we say uh, beta 7 is followed by well the funny thing is that at the time it's written it's followed by nothing well, let's call it f by actually that's a that's going to be confusing because f by i think it's taken from the prior art of um data flow programming from uh, ustalu i think i think they call f by the 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 essential stream constructor constructor i think so maybe it's not the best but it's nice and terse and I can fit it in three characters without having to press space a bunch of time too because <laughs> I don't know how to use my editor properly okay um, so followed by so following the author then uh, the moment we write beta 7 then we need to say that uh, alpha 2 is followed by 7 beta and well yeah I, that's the whole thing I'm trying to figure out because it then it feels like that's a mutation but maybe it's not a mutation because we store this in a separate index and so all is good in the world but it just feels strange and i want to that's why i went back to this whole blog post to try and figure out how they do it over there um so this is going to mutate therefore it's kind of f by seven sort of right because because f at f by seven in fact here that is called that would be uh that would be the terminator which we could call i don't know bottom oh right or one yeah maybe one right if uh, the initial element is called zero then the final element could should be called one huh and so yeah right so the moment beta writes backspace then this is what f by looks like but the moment f um, beta writes um, m capital m then uh, f by oh right so f by m becomes one and so yeah we kind of need to mutate the f by data structure there because this we also need to remove this one so i think probably that's all stuff that is done by the co-structures in the in the data type but um but it's good for me to think about this na naively first and then see how this optimization uh solve everything okay so i think this makes sense to me and i think that's the intention behind these arrows um no i'm wrong i'm totally wrong beta 7 actually points to alpha 3 because what would come after the backspace character would be alpha 3 and then alpha 3 is what right and so the the terminator is here and that doesn't actually change that doesn't mutate okay now that's proper i think let's uh let's look at it so we have a uh, alpha 2 that points to beta 7 um alpha 2 that points to well to to really ndx beta 7 which i decided to call 7 beta not beta 7 and um and m or 8 beta points to alpha 3 M points to alpha three and and um, 
alpha 6 or 6 beta points to 1. And so it means that really also actually f by 6 was this, which is another piece of info that is, um, I believe, stored in these core structures. OK. Good. So now I think I've finally got a somewhat proper handle on this, except that f, f by, I think, is wrong. I think that's going to annoy me. Let's call it something else, because f by is really, to me, is part of something that I want to see convert at some point, which is this notion of advancing time, which relates to data for programming and causal, uh, I mean, replicated data types and causal data structures. So uh, that's going to drive me crazy. So let's not call it that. Uh, how could we call it? Um, I mean, it is part of the linked list thing. So we could call it cons. Um, after and the, the problem is that everything that relates to sequence is kind of overloaded for both sequence in space as well as sequence in time. Um, oh, actually, um, where was it in the some of the pretty printing library? How they call this? Um, not next to two. Um, oh, besides, yeah, besides. Yeah, besides is interesting. Um, but it's not, it doesn't say, uh, it's not, um, I, I like, uh, what I like about follow by is that it says that this element is followed by blah. And that's, to me, really easy to parse. Um, so this thing is, um, Okay, I'll come back to it when I think of something. Naming, the hardest problem in the in computer science. Okay. So F by here. Oh god, I hate this. By. And so right. So what do we say here? Oh, and by the way, yeah, there's this other thing which is that all of this F by don't need to be filled because that's a sparse data structure, which is Smart and uh, so here, here I think TRL right. So I think in this case, um, this is all sequential in the alpha viewpoint, and so we only have a terminator reference here. And there's a question because I did use the zero initial structure here but I didn't use it here so let's um, let's do that mm. Mm. okay let's move into hexadecimal alpha and uh, right so this is uh, alpha 9 in fact and maybe let's move into capital hexadecimal make this easier to spot. OK, um, right. And so this D is, in fact, followed by, oh, right. So um, OK, let's go back to this example. Oh, well, well, OK, I'm not thinking about, well, Am I thinking about this correctly? Um, let's go back to what beta sees. For, for beta, the, for beta at time, OK, I also need to uh, re-index this. Uh -huh. 7 beta and 8 beta, or oh, beta 8. So at 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 time four, and really at, at time four for who, since we have subjective time indices, 
but I time four. And I think we mean local. I mean, I think we mean a time for beta. Yeah, I think, I think that's what I want to mean. Well, that's what I want to mean. That's, that's an interesting turn of phrase. Um, right, so the, at beta... Oh, but that's a, that's a mistake. That's an alpha four. So at... No, yeah, right. So at, at four beta, mm -hmm, then, uh, then that's the terminator indeed and then at seven beta then it has moved to the end so that's so good and um i guess we can do uh, something similar here except call it gamma and we uh, add our zero initial initiator and we say that at uh, 4 gamma we're here, but at 7 gamma we are there. That makes sense to me. Okay, so, so now we're into the interesting stuff, which is when alpha... Oh, no, hold on, I need to also do this for alpha properly at um, 4 alpha at 4 alpha we have the terminator here oh, actually that's uh, more interesting because at 5 alpha oh yeah it is very interesting because at 5 alpha the terminator is here That's cool. Really helps to see what's going on. And so we do, I don't know, we only do two backspaces and then, and then what? Then we have done our, backs, our backspaces and then, um, and then we write a character T and so now, boom, the terminator moved to there. And obviously it makes this sound. Uh, seven. Eight. Nine. Four, what? Eight. Uh, six, seven, eight. What am I saying here? I think I'm confusing myself. Four alpha is here. Yeah, there's something interesting happening with the indices. Um, okay. At time 4 alpha, terminator is here. At time 5 alpha, I suppose you could say that the terminator is here as well. Hmm. Yes, you could. And maybe it's more correct. And then you leave the interpretation of the backspace to some to the to the rendering phase let's call it like that okay so then it's not very interesting um, but it's really simple so we don't dislike it and um, right and this would be a alpha okay Oh, and so, right, A alpha, but that's exciting. We just received something from beta. We just received RD. And so, oh, but I'm forgetting something, aren't I? Uh, I'm forgetting something. Which is related to how I was also interpreting this backspace here. So when I interpreted the backspace here, because we moved the cursor, we weren't at the end. Here we also 
only doing operations that are at the end. So we don't need to maintain this kind of bidirectional arrow. And it's kind of tri the trivial case. And even this, I mean, do we need to point alpha 2 to b4? That's the question, right? And that this is the, this, the question of when do we interpret backspace? Let's look again at, well, here we don't exactly know how backspace is interpreted. I mean, we know that alpha 2 is pointing to it, though, because that's where the cursor was, right? Yeah, I'm going a little bit in circles. But so we say that we know that D actually points to the backspace because it's just after it. Oh, I see what's going on here. Here it's trivial because D is followed by backspace. And backspace is the terminator at time 5 alpha. But then the next backspace, even if it's kind of conceptually after that backspace, really it means that in the interpretation of backspace with its deleting semantics, then actually now it's kind of what I was saying before, is actually the, the, the terminator is actually sort of attached to, to D. Okay, so that's something I need to understand better from the paper, which is um, because there's, you could you could say that that's the um, that this end of the string is kind of moving backwards there. So maybe we, we annotate that in some way, maybe with a pipe. And so um, so what am I saying? I'm saying that if I delete D, then the end of the string really is M now, even though maybe for the purposes of the merge algorithm and uh, and until rendering, then we, we don't need to consider that. We, we can see the fact that we just enter the backspace and that's good enough. And here, same thing, we can say, well, we, we delete it here, but really the end of the render string, not here, but here, is, is C after two backspaces, right? And then when we when we receive when we receive from alpha, so we don't receive when we type T in alpha, then T is in fact what follows C now. So that means that so yeah, it's a little bit more involved, huh? So in fact uh, now C points to alpha seven. So it's really all about the backspace I wonder how, uh, how is that back? Is that how it's called here? Backspace. Mm, maybe a delete. Mm. Okay, I'll probably um, it's probably called something specific in there. Uh, ba, 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 shift table, password, out of order, of sparse index. Okay, let's look again at this. This seems to say, no, in the chronofold, we don't care in the chronofold we just care about the ordering of these operations and we'll interpret what they mean later. And so it means that in the chronofold, C is not followed by alpha 7. 
that's only the case in the after all of the rendering pass. In fact, of uh, alpha six is followed by alpha seven, and and that's it. So, so can I strike this? No, it's fine. Uh, so not. Oh well, it was doing it, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, not alpha seven. Um, okay. Um, although after right so after render. Alpha two is followed by alpha seven. But we don't care until render. That's the way to say it, I think. <clears throat> okay, so now how does this pan out when we are um, when we're here in the end and we receive a D then then I think it's the case so again that we're just moving we're just in the simplest case. How is this simple case called? And that definitely in the paper. Um, here they, when it talks about the sparse representation. So maybe if I look at sparse, that will. Sparse array. So that's already in the constructors, yeah? Mm hmm. It's end of spending memory for every such value. So in a typical chronofall, most of the next NDX pointers would be equal to i plus one. So that's exactly where we see here. The next blah is equal to i plus one, except in those cases, right? Like, uh, instead of spending memory for every such value, we might offload them to a separate sparse array where only non-trivial pointers are mentioned. In the resulting implementation, a thinned chronofold is simply a log of UDF. 32 code points. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. As yet another optimization, we may notice that non BMP code points are very rare. If so, we may reduce the core current fault to a UTF 16 string where all non BMP code points are marked with a special value. So in a yet another sparse array. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely going to be one of the later optimization. Uh, let's return to the secondary log carrying op type step of ref indices. Author indices tend to match our local log index in practice. Uh -huh. Even if not, spans will have the same mass. So we haven't we bypassed spans, which are really interesting in their own right. Um, but maybe actually it is in, in spans because this is what we are adding at the back of that. Um, so span in um, log indices create a stable addressing system for the indices text as long as we stay within the same replica and same linearization indices are not affected by edits. This is built code structures over the data structure linked to the text through log indices right which become subjective themselves but efficient. Uh, code structure reference text ranges but instead of text positions they use log indices so no correction needed right right. Yeah, so indeed, but although I guess when you do something like a highlight on screen, then you need some conversion at the moment of, at the moment where you want to create that range between like a screen coordinate that's kind of character based to this subjective log index. Uh, I guess we've either used 
if you commit a simple example, we may track a binary attribute by keeping a, a bitmap, either with a letter, uh, e.g. whether a letter is bold. For richer attributes, we may use a vector, although keeping track of individual characters may not be the most convenient approach. In case we need to reference character ranges, one possible data structure is a range map. Yeah, I can't wait to try and implement this. Uh, namely, we divide a chrono fold into a number of sem semi-intervals. Each interval has uniform for formatting. Uh, formatting we keep in a sorted map when iterating. Okay, so um, that's just to add metadata to the raw text structure. Uh, it doesn't. It's not part of the implementation, uh, as opposed to this next NDX uh, sparse array trick. Uh, as text editors tend to operate in row column coordinates, we may dedicate another code structure to that. Part. Right, okay. So, indeed, um, just having a, a conversion table between uh, row column coordinates and then log, the subjective log is the, the thing that would speed up um, doing things like highlighting. Uh, we may dedicate another code structure, uh, namely table of contents, listing log indices of all the effective new lines of the. Oh, right, yes, right, 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 right. Yes, I remember hearing about this trick from other, uh, from some other place. Having that, we can start iteration from an arbitrary line beginning. This way, we may avoid storing the plain text as a separate structure. Yeah, that I don't... Uh, instead, we may produce any line of text on demand by scanning the respective piece of the weave. So that's really interesting, but obviously you're going to have this somewhere, at least in video memory, right? Uh, so it's not a separate structure. You can render on it on demand, but it needs to be persisted uh, somewhere. But, but maybe this opens up some optimization between when it's, when and where we do the calculation and how it's shipped to GPU memory. I don't know. Instead, we may produce any line of text on demand by scanning the repetitive piece of the weave. Also, that means that maybe there's some kind of like monoidal structure there. Um, that'd be really fun to play around with as well. Uh, again, co structures make a chrono fold extremely flexible. Okay, note that uh, slightly out of date co structure can still be applied to the chrono fold if that makes sense. As co structures are decoupled from the chrono fold, they can be deactivated, restored, rebuilt, or updated all independently from the editing process. Right, right, right. I think that connects to a bit of the of this approach uh, in here, or maybe it's even something that I've seen somewhere else from later work, where um, where you can actually have different processes doing the highlighting from the initial text rendering, and so I think that that's what it hints at there. You can do that in separate separate passes and actually in separate threads, uh, which is super cool. Um, okay, so this doesn't say much about or more about the structure of this next pointers. Actually, I could really call this next, but uh, let's call this next. Okay. Ah, right, right, right. Um, let's return to the secondly log carrying up time step and refing DCs. Section three. Okay, so actually, I probably just missed that as well. From section three, there's a secondary in secondary. That's how it's called. All right. Wow, this is really slow. Well, <laughs> yeah, text representation in the PDF. Um, anyway, in part, we already, okay, so that's that's the, what I was reading. Secondly, log here. Simplest way to store that metadata, well, let's look at it a bit. Uh, uh, importantly, if we edit a text 
locally the necrophile itself suffices namely as per remark to three the timestamp of a new locally authored op is greater than all the timestamp in the log uh, so that's local ordering uh, subjective ordering as it, it's called of the replica um, that excludes the case of preemptive sibling so ndx minus one is not needed right 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 uh, is that okay so there's something i still don't understand here hey you want to hack welcome back um so uh, let's uh reread this maybe from even a little bit before a note that the chronofold building algorithm uses information that is not included into the chronofold itself hey drink yeah actually you're so right i'm gonna drink uh i i need water i feel parched uh i'll be back in uh five seconds okay 15. Fantastic. Thanks, one hack. Um, okay. Note that the chronofold building algorithm uses information that is not included in the chronofold itself, namely, that is the tree forming ref relation. So I think I'm confusing ref and w, something like that. Um, w is the operation following alpha i in the weave. in the weave, right? Not in the chronofold. Ugh. Right, uh, a fade effect. I can do that actually. Um, chat box, um, beam. Right, yeah, maybe it's a bit long. You're right that it, it does stay. Um, so I say uh, one minute, beam. Um, I kept it that way when I was experimenting, but you're right that it's better this way. Uh, all right. <clears throat> Let's see. Second log. Uh, D -D -D. 6 to 10 seconds. Yeah. I'll keep it like this and then maybe change it some of the time. Um, all right, note that the chronofold building algorithm is information that is not included. Right, this, this question about ref and the NDX, I, I think I'm still, so, yeah, because here it's called next, and here it's called W, NDX of W, and then there's also ref, right? And so what is ref? Uh, ref, CT parent is ref. So, right, so the CT parent, that's, okay, so that's cool, that's really interesting, and that's something I absolutely need to elucidate for myself before actually programming, so that's that's good. Um, so I think uh, CT parent is the fact that beta 7 comes after alpha 6 here, and that uh, it means that the CT parent of beta 7 is alpha 6, and in, the, in this representation, um, um, gamma 7 has as a parent alpha 6 as well which is what triggers this whole sibling and merge conflict algorithm stuff um, locate the new op ct parent ref um, and then it inserts the op after its parents unless it finds preemptive CT siblings at that location, meaning other people uh, attached to the same CT parent. Um, right, ops with greater timestamps also having um, the same ref. So that's the that's the key of the CT algorithm, and so ref means that ref is. So in most of my cases, but I haven't completely unfolded all of the um, all of the stuff there. But so um, here, beta seven, right, right, right. So if I'm in replica gamma, then I know locally that 
Gamma 7's CT parent is alpha 6. And I don't need to compute it because it just comes in the natural order. But then when I receive the beta payload, and that beta tells me, hey, my CT parent is alpha 6 as well, then I need to run the preemptive sibling algorithm or the causal tree merging algorithm. So in fact, I thought that these arrows played some role in the merge resolution algorithm, but they don't. They um, and I think uh, this this tree, I think, represents. However, the, and these arrows do represent the CT parent um, in this example, um, and I, I, yeah, I think so. Um, mm -hmm. And so cursor position or order in the sequence and causal parent are a different thing. And so that's good. And maybe then I call this, well, I don't want to call this ref. I think follow um, and followed by might be the right thing. I don't know, but I need to extend this um, example to gamma now. And so I'll do this. Um, bum, bum, bum. And yeah, gamma is this repeated four times and I N S K. And so it's, oh, well, here I will replace. Can I Unicode in here? No. So I'll replace beta by gamma in yeah I think in no in oh yeah yeah here that didn't work well, yeah, that's because I didn't copy gamma and that's because I didn't have a gamma on screen Boop. Okay, no, 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 no. How come you didn't do that? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, I needed to uh, match the selection. Hey, no, you're right. One hack, the basic ID works for any number of data types. And um, while I was uh, really quiet, I shared uh, this, which is the, the work, the previous work of the author of this paper, of the Chronofold data structure. And uh, still working very actively on this and think there's going to be new stuff coming up from that. But some of the ideas in here are really awesome because this approach indeed works for pretty much any data type and he goes further than just making the making it work also for let's say composite data types share instant data changes between computer yeah exactly exactly um, and text is just one example of it and it just happened that this chronofold thing is optimized for text rendering but the overall concept of a replicated data structure works for any number of data structures including things that you would typically store inside your database if you have an ability to um, allow convergence of a data structure across multiple replicas then you don't need a central database anymore so for you know you might need a central database for certain cases but for others you might not and so um, and these replicated these different types of basic replicated data types and with this work on on ron there's a way to think about composition of data structures so you can make a big replicated data types out of smaller replicated data types which if ha each have their own characteristic and so the data structure we're looking at now is actually RGA is the same as a as CT or causal tree is the same as replicable growable array. So it's for ordered collections. It's the same thing for a set, and then same thing for like product types. So things like records or uh, typically, 
then you then a last win last win right strategy might work. So you need to introduce something new to your thinking about data structures, which is it's not just going to be a flat data structure and then you know you you say please replicate it. You're going to kind of need to say well to annotate it in, in in how I think about it to say this is the semantics of the replication that I want because this thing is ordered. I want it to be an RGA or a CT or something like that or it's just a bunch of uh, you know things where I don't care about the order and therefore it's fine to put it in an OR set or to put it in the last white right win structure because I actually am happy if the latest person that wrote to that to that part of the product type or to that field in the record is the one that wins um, but that's not going to be necessarily you know all use cases so you, if you use these kind of data structures, you kind of need to think about how you want them to behave in this kind of replicated setting. Uh, why can't you let AI simulate data structures? Or is it difficult for them? Well, you know, what I would say about this is that um, it's an interesting question. I like the question. AI, um, there's, a, there's a question of how do you communicate your intent to the AI? How does the AI know what you want? And I think um, that is the input issue of AI. And then the output issue of AI is how do you know how the AI is achieving its goal? How can you tell the AI, no, no, actually, uh, could you do this instead? And in general, it's not so easy, apart from basically training it with something different, at least with, I, I should say, with uh, connectionist AI. Um, Yes, exactly. The paperclip idea with connectionist AI, you we don't know how to. Uh, yeah, there's there's a uh, there's a there's a, the the apprentice sorcerer paperclip problem, which is that AI is going to take over the the world to make paperclips, and uh, so so yeah, that that's where we are with uh, with AI, and I personally think that I mean you know following on the footstep of some people that are smarter than me and that think about this stuff is that uh, um, maybe I'm extrapolating here but is that there's maybe the the, the sweet spot is uh, to have a connectionist uh, sorry symbolic um, IO with a connectionist runtime for AI something like that maybe that would work uh, to allow us to speak with um, uh, with AI and make sure that they they can tell us about what they do and we can tell them what we'd like them to do um, in a way that um, fits the way that the human mind uh, expresses itself with language and stuff. Um, right. Um, so yeah, so that's the thing here, right? And and what you're asking is actually uh, similar to, hey, why can't, why can't we have AI just write programs for us, right? So. It's the same thing. Well, in fact, if AI needs to write a program for us, then it also needs to figure out what data structure it needs to use, right? And so same issue. The question is, how do you communicate basically the spec? How do you communicate what you want? And um, you can communicate that roughly by throwing a bunch of examples and try to train it to do what you want, which is the state of you know, um, neural network-based AI these days. But sometimes you want other types of guarantees or other types of behaviors that you want to uh, that you want the, your program to follow and usually when you're a developer and that you do that by hand you write down a spec you write down how you want your program to behave and right now we don't know how to give a spec to an AI and have it program uh, program for us even though with GPT-3 it gets it it gets to be the to to pretend that it's doing it in a way that's pretty impressive Optimizing, well, it, I, I think it, it's really interesting to think about this thing because maybe from a performance perspective, it could be more, uh, um, you know, better at, at humans to find out uh, recipes that it could apply. But, you know, most of the recipes that, that, like the form that we have those recipe in these days are more like kind of algorithms and specs and whatnot. Um, so maybe if we feed, feed all that to an AI, it could, you know, uh, look at something and be like, I think this fits this optimization solution, um, therefore I'm going to try and apply it. So that that could be possible. But it's still, 
in some sense rely on the, on the spec of what you want the program to do, right? Because if all of a sudden the AI says, well, all our sets are easier and they, you know, they necessitate less processing power and less uh, disk space, which I'm pretty sure is the case, uh, then it might change something into an unordered collection and then all of a sudden yeah, your playlist that you carefully ordered in the right order is unordered now. And you're like, no, I wanted it ordered. And so, you know, I, I wanted it ordered as part of the spec and uh, you want to communicate that somehow. Um, it's You can't just ask the AI, you know, the AI doesn't know what a playlist is and how you're using it. So at some point you're going to need to utter the word ordered in your spec, uh, in your conversation with your AI programmer. And uh, then it's going to take that as a spec and be like, okay, then maybe I should use an RGA and, you know, I need to, I need to guarantee that order is going to be preserved. Yeah. And what's not magic is expressing our intentions, right? Which is the paperclip problem is that if you just say to the AI, do paperclips, then it can be interpreted as as you know, do whatever is needed uh, in order to, to to do paper clips, which then becomes this nightmare. So it's really a specification problem. Um, and how uh, and um, and you know we have the same issue between humans. A lot of things sometimes is about being clear about what you're doing, what you're what you want to achieve, what you try to do, and there's a lot of. Uh, ways in which we can get this wrong because it's it's really hard problem, and um, and building AI might I mean it could be that um, in a conversational way right which is what humans do is like okay hold on do you mean this or do you mean that right which is why I think personally that conversational interfaces to AI are going to be you know really key, but um, yeah these days it's. Uh, I, it's really hard to come out with the perfect specification just using speech because people use speech differently. Um, yeah. How to create a hardware circuit to create some, some hardware circuit. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's, I think, from the dawn of uh, cybernetics, uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, and before that, right? I think, you, have you seen this image of um, like uh, the, the, the ancestor of the Turing test where it's like this old box where there's some kind of human in there. Uh, can I find this um, Turing test? Like if I if I Google image Turing test, uh, will this come up? Maybe it's too 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 old, and, and it predates the Turing test. Maybe it's the, the is it connected to Babbage? No. A GPT three, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, it is. It's incredible what can be done with uh, with uh, with such large amount of uh, data to train your AI. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but it's and and have you seen what it tries to do with um, with computers? With computer code is actually it seems like it's it's pretending very well that it knows how to program if you're not a programmer you wouldn't be able to tell you'd be like wow it's actually able to program um but it, it's not really but um and and you know i i don't think that it's going to be able to do that without understanding uh logic um in a way that's sort of its own subdomain let's say or you know mathematics in a way that isn't you know, might be running on a neural network substrate, but is really tested in some way independently to actually perform proper logic. Um, and yeah, it's not clear that actually a neural network is the proper substrate for that. Um, the fact that we've evolved as humans logic on top of our neural network, uh, biological neural network substrate doesn't mean that um, that it's the proper way to uh, infuse machines with, with it. Um, it, could, it might be simpler to just, you know, let them do type inference and, and logic programming in the way that we do it traditionally. And so it goes back to this hybrid model of like a, more of a, a mix between ex expert systems and, and neural networks and interfacing that properly. Um, so symbolic and connectionist AI.
But, you know, I don't know. It, it, it goes into the realm of sort of explainable AI, right? Like, how do you get AI to tell, tell us about what they're doing and have some way to, uh, not eat, uh, to, for them not to be a black box? Anyway, there's this old, uh, old picture that, that looks like uh, an old Turing test. Uh, um, and uh, I, I can't find it, but it's, uh, it's cool. Um, yeah. So, you know, they still work for us programmers, so try and do things. Um, even when, um, even though we have super intelligent uh, AI software engineers, then there's still going to be that spec moment, right? Where, uh, and people, it might, it's funny to imagine that people might be also, you know, frustrated by the fact that the AI programmer asks like really tough questions about how things are supposed to work, because it actually really needs those things to actually build. Um, build a program that is going to do those things and that uh, that, that will push humans to uh, explore things that they that ha they haven't thought about right which is the fairly traditional discussion between people who come up with some ideas and the software engineers who are going to implement them it's like okay but hold on what exactly happens when people click here when this has happened before and it's like oh well i didn't didn't think about that well and then you need to figure it out so this will be unavoidable with, even with AI. You still have that conversation, which is fun to imagine. Okay. All right. Um, what was I doing? Oh yeah, I was uh, finishing my uh, my notation, which includes the sort of data structure annotation on the main chronofold and trying to elucidate that. You know, just like. Um, doing what what a, a poor human has to do uh, to uh, to uh, understand something which is to put it down on like at least digital paper right um, okay well, mm -hmm. and a B C, D, E and, oh well, that's going to be very boring. There's the same thing where two AIs communicate to each other, one creates human images and the other tells it whether it looks normal for human or not. Ah, right, right, right. Yeah, that's called uh, adversarial GANs, or I think. Um, it's like, uh, what a GAN is a, or maybe GAN actually includes that, GAN neural net. Generative adversary, no, yeah, uh, yeah, generative adversarial network, yeah, yeah, that's right. It becomes a new technique to to learn is that uh, you make your deep fake detection, you plug it into a fake a deep fake generator, and then you allow them to do a little arms race together, and um, and then they improve. Indeed. It's crazy. And it's a bit like a similar thing that Alpha AlphaGo Zero, right? Which is the the computing the, the Go computer actually not being bootstrapped with human games, but actually sort of started to play with itself uh, with a basic set of rules and then rapidly becoming better than not only humans but um, also other computers that were programmed in a different way. So that's uh, that's crazy stuff. And it's it's hard to think about what the limits of such techniques are indeed and you know i'm i'm not sure whether what i'm saying is correct that you know that we need to inject some symbolism in there um, and maybe it's the case that you know the symbolism would emerge and perfect uh, ironclad logic will emerge out of uh, neural nets and then they'll be fine and then they'll, they'll be explainable by themselves it's it's possible too i can i can imagine that um, right, so what happened to my next? And I think what the most interesting it was happened to my to my ref or um, right because what we were saying is that there's an implicit ref from alpha six to beta seven here. Um, I mean, we can call it ref, I imagine, right? Let, let's make sure we get it in the right order, though, because um, here it mentioned ref, and 
the following operation in the weave. Is that the ref? No, I don't, I don't think so. This is the next, not the ref. I don't think. I may be confused by the notation here, ref. CT parent. The new op city parent. Yeah, so so the new op city parent. Okay, so that points to its parent. So right. So we can uh, write it as a um, write it as a sparse array uh, in the same way. But it only kicks in when we start to um, to receive data from gamma here. So. That's the interesting bit. So when we start receiving gamma stuff from gamma seven here, that's when actually we need to say, hold on, gamma seven actually references as its parent alpha two. I think that's correct, yes. That's the causal tree structure. Um, and then at the end of gamma, when we put the beta stuff, we say that the beta stuff is connected to alpha two. And is it alpha 2 or 2 alpha? I think it's really alpha 2, right? But there's this, I think probably, I mean, it's probably also in the paper, but I think i is the is the local subjective index. Oh, hold on, no, yeah. i is the subjective index. So do we mean to say alpha 2 here, or do we mean to say, in fact, 2 gamma? Because it's the local replica. I think that's it. Um, Right, right, right. So actually, that's a function. So it will, depending on what the data structure is like, this will actually maybe take some cycles um, to, to, to compute. So um, k gamma is the local translation of, I guess, alpha 2. And so I think, yes. So there's, a, so it's, ref of um, hmm. so in beta when we receive beta 7 oh, that's the thing though is that when we send stuff we need to add that causal reference and so maybe we can make an optimization but um, yeah when when beta when beta sends its beta seven, then it kind of needs to also send the fact that this is this is causally linked to alpha two, because it needs to send this whole column over the network for it to be re re uh, received by uh, by gamma with the alpha two annotation. That that comes from that comes from beta the alpha uh, I wrote, yeah alpha two annotation here. Uh, maybe I should make a new line here um, and here. Yeah, um, we'll not distract you anymore since we we'll make you take longer to do stuff. Hey, it's good to talk about this stuff, so no, don't worry about it. I wish I had thought about this stuff. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's good to it's good to discuss this, right? It is the it is the future of uh, oh, it's the future of uh, technology. So concerns us all um okay right so so that's interesting right because it means that oh hold on there's an issue here it's not alpha alpha 2 it's alpha 6 oh i see that there's some something that's still a little bit confused in my mind between the indices the because from a causal 
Arrow standpoint. Sure, beta 7 acts on alpha 2, and that's what the next thing tells us. But the real key here, the beta 7 happens after alpha 6. That's the thing. So I'm confused here. It's not alpha 2, it's alpha 6. And that's why it can be sparse, because it just happens that the way to put it into words uh, is that replica beta 7 enters its right after it has read alpha stuff un up to 6. And it happens that that's the same thing that gamma 7 does implicitly. And so maybe it doesn't need to be stored until it's sent. And then that also opens up potential optimization with regards to how many times does it need to be stored and whether it's stored at the beginning or at the end. So that stuff, so there's the linked list of the order of operation, and then there's this causal reference that is more linked to time. So here it's not alpha two, it's alpha six. And here it's also alpha six. And we receive this gamma seven together with its alpha six um, annotation. And so in fact, it makes sense to only send it once and because actually the rest is going to be in order. And so it's the same as not putting in anything there. And except that when we add, um, it said that when we get beta, yeah, we need to store it. I mean, basically that's, that's, that's what allows us to detect uh, the preemptive, preemptive CT sibling case is exactly that is that um, but um, is that we have um, two stretches of operations that are attached to the same CT parent but uh, we are uh, but the, the question is whether it's yeah alpha 6 or alpha 2 <clears throat> here the causal tree is listed as attaching the this operation to M not to K so it seems like in fact, it's really alpha two and not alpha six. So that's quite interesting. Maybe because, I don't know why. Oh, maybe because it doesn't matter. Because it doesn't matter. Um, I was going to say it doesn't matter because this thing starts at P, so it doesn't matter if whether or not this whole INSK stuff has been is present or not. But then when there's four deletions like this, then obviously it matters. But so, okay, so in this notation, clearly the alpha 6 would be connected to gamma 7 there. But then the question is whether this back, uh, backspace M is it alpha 6 here Or maybe the whole point of this chronofold thing is that just by storing the two directions of the arrow in that leak list, you get the you get the you get the causal tree arrow for free because this points to because alpha 2 points to 7 beta. Huh. Yeah. 
that would explain why there isn't a ref here, because it can be calculated with the with the linked list. Huh. So ref is derived. And so if, knowing this, then if we say ref of i beta, let's say I'm, I think in this case we we we're gamma and we get we're getting some betas coming our way. Then the ref of i beta beta seven is alpha three because we can calculate the ref based on the on the index. Is that right? Okay, keep a secondary log of op timestamp and their ref indices. It has to convert the fact that I receive from beta, I receive something that says beta 7 and alpha. It's not the alpha 3 that matters, it's the fact that the, the parent is the same. So, hence the reverse index, I think. <laughs> yes, let's not forget to drink. Thank you. <laughs> Appreciate it. And I'm also going to need to take a, to um, um, to close the stream um, maybe in like a half hour and 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 uh, and call it a call it an evening and 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 get dinner as well. So. It'd be lovely to sort this stuff out, which is really how it goes. Once once I understand this, I think I can really start implementing. Um, I think I'll do. I think I'll do. Um, I'll do this uh, tomorrow as well. Um, yeah, I'm. I've kind of been streaming every day, but uh, at different times. Uh, but I think. Um, yeah, w which time zone are you in? Um, I was, uh, I, what time did I start? Three hours now? I started around uh, five o'clock. <laughs> you need the schedule, glad to hear. Yeah, I think, I think I'll start again at around like 5 p.m. US Central. So like, uh, I started about, uh, yeah, almost four hours ago, right? So to me, local time, I'm, uh, I'm in Central Europe, in Berlin. So it's uh, getting into the, uh, getting to be 9, 9 p.m. So 9 p.m. means, um, yeah, like, uh, I don't know, 2 p.m. for you or something. So you, you're, it's, it's the day for you, right? Uh, so I think, I'll, I think I'll start again around like 5 p.m. tomorrow, maybe. Yeah, I think that's good because I might be able to maintain that when I get back to, to having a, a, a full-time employment again. So I think that would allow me to maybe switch that to maybe 8 to maybe uh, 6 p.m. Uh, Central European time. So let's see, 6 p.m. CET in U.S. Central time. How's this? How's this like? Yeah, 11 a.m. So when I start back working, so tomorrow I might be uh, starting around 5, 5 p.m., uh, you know, you can catch things later as well, if it's too early for you. I don't know. Um, but I think I'll do something like that. Start at 5 p.m. or 6 p.m. And probably do it every day, but, you know, I might not do four hours every day. That's that's the thing. And uh, uh, as I, you know, get used to, to this um, to this streaming uh, life, I guess, or <laughs> then uh, I'll probably start... Um, converging toward a more stable um, uh, easy to understand schedule um, but for now I'll say I start around 5 or 6 p.m. Um, CET um, all right let's see right I think that if I understand the secondary log thing then that will help me understand the whole ref business and then I think I'll be pretty much ready to start implementing this and modify my 
missed uh, my first attempt at the data structure that probably is missing a few things. Um, so keep a center secondary log of up time stamps and their ref indices. So up time stamp is this, and then ref indices indices is locally that I might have something. Okay, yeah, that that, that needs to be fixed. Uh, M nine A B C D E, and then I receive beta seven, right? So the interesting thing is that this is subjective as well, meaning my secondary log will be different on each machine, which is the key to how this thing works, which means that beta, beta 7 on replica beta is at index, index 7 beta, whereas beta 7 on replica gamma is at index, index f gamma. And so what this secondary log is, is this log from up timestamp to local index in the replica. But now we're talking about something else. We're talking about up timestamp to the ref. And so, right, 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 right. Because, because when I get my beta 7, I also get my alpha 3. But that's the whole thing that I feel like things are a bit reversed. Because the most important is that, um, is the reverse index, really, it feels like. So, maybe my solution is to call this, you know, um, um, supercrypt uh, minus 1. So it's really next minus one that I'm looking at here and uh, at time six. So I need a little bit more room. Because um, that's the thing that I feel like is easier to represent. So I'm going to then therefore switch those things. And so I'm going to say that the beta seven points to its parent alpha two. And that um three beta points to and maybe maybe I'll maybe I'll keep maybe I'll keep the the next version for okay no don't delete everything that may be a little bit radical okay I'll copy that and I'll go back in time um mm -hmm. let's go back in time to post indentation world and let's consider then oh well no let's consider this and indent things Is that right maybe we'll see So that's how it's written, I think, in here, in terms of the direction of the arrows. And if we store the arrows elsewhere, then um, then this thing has um, 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 how does it work? Seven beta. Seven beta's next thing is the alpha three. You know what? Let's call the. If we call it next, then it makes sense to call it prev or previous, which is the reverse of next. And then um, this and this this and so we say that the previous thing of seven beta is alpha two yeah that's correct and so therefore what is important afterwards is what is the previous thing of i and that's going to be eight beta
except that it's yes except that that's the final state but no here it's actually seven beta is that correct okay um so at time seven i've inserted only the backspace so my ct parent is alpha two and then um therefore the previous of I is seven beta. Yeah, that's correct. It's seven beta. And then after I've inserted also M, then I don't need to note that because the previous is, is that one, so I can be sparse. But I need to uh, mutate this by saying that now what what is before I is actually M, not backspace anymore. Okay, and so Oh, and so maybe that's the reason why this is better, because I don't need to mutate 7 beta, whereas right here I need to mutate 8 beta. Interesting. Yeah, it might be that that's why next is actually what is inside the proposed chronofold data structure. Huh. Very cool. So, so what now in replication? Let's um, get this guy back and uh, hey, why not? One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And let's do the same thing here, except we don't need Preven next. Well, we could have it really. I mean, because this is mostly um, yeah, yeah we have it it's just that it's um, it's not interesting it's just one it's just a terminator okay and maybe we need a new line here definitely need a few new lines here and there we go okay so let's right so then what happens in when we have when we have a gamma in terms of next we're now at um I, actually i was doing this here so let, let's do let's do it here so we've done all the gammas and uh, but do we have this correct because this was the pre, this was the the next thing and was the next thing correct at gamma seven we had alpha three as the next thing um, that makes sense and the the next of alpha two was gamma seven that makes sense and then as we add things we um, we move this forward nine a and indeed, the uh, this identifier, identifier stays stable, which is probably part of the magic. And then, when we add i, then, then is that still true? Then the causal parent. Hey, no, I'm doing something wrong here. No, no. It's just that there's a, a, a way to interpret the sparse array, maybe, that, that comes into play here. What is after gamma 8 is alpha 3. If alpha 3 is here, can you still say hmm. can you still speed up the computation of gamma of the indexing of the next thing hmm. i'm not sure mm. all right have a nice lunch and uh, see you tomorrow, I guess, because I'll, I'll stop in five minutes.
Yes, you know, I'm at a standing desk, so at least I'm not completely breaking my, my spine. Uh, but my, uh, my feet are feeling it after four or four hours. Um, see you later, and thanks for the interaction. That was really cool. All right. Um, so, beta, gamma, gamma at B. What comes after gamma at B uh, time B is I. So no, that's all. That's all good. That all works. And so we continue. See you more. And uh, B C D. And E. And alpha three. Here we go. And so when beta comes over the network, beta 7, then there's something when we actually receive beta with its, with its, uh, we need to receive beta with its payload, the, 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 the next payload, right? So. Yeah, the question is, do we receive it with a alpha 3? Uh, yeah, I, I think I start to understand what the trade-offs are here. Because we, we receive it with alpha 3, and it makes... The fact that we maintain next as part of the core structure, I think, means that we privilege fast appends. But then maybe when we read from the network, then we need to do a reverse lookup. But it also means that we don't need to mutate stuff. So yeah, I can totally see why you need that, that this next thing is a more stable data structure. So we receive beta 7 with its alpha 3 thing, and then is that enough for us to say that we have a, a primitive city sibling? And I think it's not supposed to not be, because we need to re locally reinterpret it. We need to pass it to ref. And so we receive alpha 3, and we like... If you, if the thing that followed you was alpha three, Do we want, yeah, that's the question of where these things are located, right? Because it seems like what we want to know is that this, this gamma 7, or let's say the data, the element at the 7 gamma index has the same CT parent than alpha 3. Then, uh, then the new, then what we received from beta, which is at local time f gamma, and at um, ten gamma here, uh, I guess we could uh, go into uh, whatever whatever decimal uh, thing to alpha alpha decimal whatever that means um, base uh, base alphabet base numbers plus alphabet and as far as I want <laughs> um, bum, bum, bum. so I receive a backspace so I I know what the, the next doesn't give me the CT parent right the CT parent for this, I need to maintain this this reverse index, because the CT parent of of seven gamma is alpha two, which I know with this reverse index. But then I don't get the reverse index of of beta, right? So maybe there's an optimization here. Oh. <laughs> Mm. 
Yeah, maybe there is. Because maybe if beta sends me alpha 2, not the local stuff, then, then it's much easier to compare. Because otherwise, how do I do the reverse lookup, which is supposed to be in beta's coordinates, beta's time, local time? So, and I, you know, I, I, I would need to come up with an example for that, but then coming empty right now. But like, okay, we receive beta seven, and let's say we receive it with its with its next data structure. Okay, so that's the good example. But then we don't know really that the reverse is that seven beta point to to it. Oh, hold on, I'm, am I confusing causal tree with? With next again? I think I am. Oh no, but hold on. <laughs> we said that that was the same thing. So it's just a question of how do we deduce the causal parent from the from next? That's really is the is the is the question. And from next, we can deduce the causal parent by doing a reverse lookup. Meaning we need to know if we are beta seven then we need to traverse the data structure or have an index, but or traverse the data structure until we find some alpha that points to seven beta, which is our local coordinate. So, but if we do the same thing here, it wouldn't work, right? Because we do beta seven, but we yeah exactly we would fail at scanning the data structure and finding a seven gamma in it because it's there's a seven a seven a, a seven beta in it because there's a seven gamma so we need to send the reverse index stuff over the network don't we pretty sure so it's all good if we store this in the data structure but before we ship it over the network it sounds like we need to ship this reverse index version because then we ship alpha 2, let's say here, and then we're like, hey, well, there's also still there's already an alpha 2 here, and then we know right away that we need to do preemptive sibling merging stuff. And then receiving beta 8 in the reverse structure just doesn't change anything. Because then, in the kind of sparser representation, then we know that the causal thing is the, the one naturally in the previous spot, so then we don't have to say anything about it. I think. If we right, 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 index of the preceding character should already be known. So index not in the beta. So maybe we maybe that's the the key way to understand this. So and I will um, I will leave on trying to formulate this as a sentence. And then maybe contact the author also to verify my intuition. Okay, so um, the next NDX value in the chronofold struct is, and I also read the paper <laughs> again before asking the author is kept um, points to the next entry to maintain uh, to maintain uh, an append-only mm. 
representation. I mean, I have a real doubt on this because of the fact that my alpha three is moving there, but it seems like maybe we can make a, if we interpret the sparse representation with alpha three here, maybe it still works. And then um, when sending an op, we send I mean, if we send the local, okay, no, there's something else I want to write here. Point to the next entry to maintain an append. No, there's an intermediary thought. Thought is how does the next NDX value relate to the causal parent? And so the so we derive the CT parent from. From the NXT, um, from the inverse of NXT, right, right, from uh, NXT minus one, mm -hmm. so that's the beauty of the structure is that. We have a linked list, and it also allows us to have the causal tree stru structure derived from it. But it seems like we need the N NXT, NXT uh, minus one. Actually, there's nowhere that talks about NXT minus one in here. Is there something that talks about NXT minus one here? No. So I'm inventing terminology here. I'm not sure. So that's, I will need to align this, but. Um, In essence, what do I mean with regards to the parent? I mean, index of the W, I mean, NDX minus one of the W of, of alpha I, is that what I mean? It's W of alpha i is alpha three, and and the x of alpha three is three gamma. Yeah, that's not what I mean. So I do mean nxt minus one, in fact, except that it's not talked about here. So I might be misunderstanding something. NXT minus one defined as what then? Defined as um, um, yeah, I'm confused with the indices, indices here. This might be instead of being alpha two, this might be two alpha. Hey, yeah, I, I I'm trying to uh, yes, yeah, still here. <laughs> That's true. I was trying to uh, summarize what I've learned in my. In my last, um, in my last stretch of thinking, to to see if I could, uh, to, well, to try and remember it, and then to reread the paper with that in mind, and then uh, contact the author of the paper if I um, if I get stuck again. Um, so I was trying to, you know, write down my thought as a summary before I before I take off. So um, we derive the city parent from NXT minus one. So more precisely. In that case, for instance, here, NXT3 is alpha, th so it's NXT. So for um, uh, EG, um, no, not NXT3, NXT of, um, let's say, seven, 7 gamma. is equal to alpha three, right? Yeah, that's not what we want. Um, so NXT minus one, well, okay, let's write this. NXT of seven gamma is 
alpha two. So that's that's fine. We know that. And that's all good. But NXT minus one. Of seven gamma. Is the causal parent, and that's alpha two. And then I think I need to write. Um, And the truth is, this is it's actually NXT at seven gamma of gamma seven is maybe the better way to write this. Yeah, I think that's that's correct. So NXT at seven gamma of gamma seven is alpha three, and NXT at seven gamma of Gamma seven is alpha two. Okay, I think I'm going to need to align this to see the symmetry. And then um Right, and this is no, um, at 7 gamma, there is no 8 gamma. However, at 8 gamma, there is a gamma 7, and it's still, is it, and it's not, well, it's nothing now. Whatever that means, in this parsary context, and defining what it means is part of understand, uh, making an implementation that uh, means something. And then, and then the causal parent seems to still be alpha two, right? And that's at time eight gamma now. Even though we've events in time, gamma seven still has alpha two as a causal parent. And then um, what about alpha eight? Well, now we have alpha uh, uh, gamma eight. I mean, what about NXT a gamma of gamma eight. Well, that's NXT a gamma of gamma eight. Then that's that's alpha three actually. Uh, alpha three has moved there. Mm -hmm. And then what's the causal parent for that then now? Well, causal parent for that is actually uh, you could say is empty because it's just the one that comes before in our sparse array representation. So maybe we should really say that it's empty, but it really means gamma seven. Actually, that might be a smarter way to not not do the sparse thing, not to jump the gun on that. And then in that case, next of a gamma of gamma seven. Then yeah, it's a good question. What is what comes next? Well, it's uh, gamma eight. That's what it is. Or is it, yeah, it's gamma eight. So it really means gamma eight here when we say zero. Okay. And so that to me seems like that's the causal parent, and it seems to me that to calculate it, we need to have we need to do some stuff. Uh, with the indexing but that's it i'll stop here because i think i've wrote down the my current uh, level of understanding uh, uh well enough that i can pick it up tomorrow and so thanks a lot for watching um it's been a pleasure to in interact one and um see you tomorrow at uh, around 5 or 6 p.m uh, ct for more chronofold pure scripts research paper reading goodness take care thanks